now okay i think we are uh live what is going on everybody this is randall thor 19 the man with the million with a patreon episode for xbox two plus one and it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one this is uh probably the most requested guest we've had and we'll, we'll get to him in just a second but jez you're here managing editor windows central uh Hello. how you doing buddy I'm doing quite well, although earlier I did give myself food poisoning. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Wow, what'd you eat? I, don't, I, I, man, my girlfriend like she's always putting like leftovers in the fr in the fridge, man. And I was just looking for something to eat, and I had some pasta. Apparently, it's been in there for a week. So, <laughs> so you can't eat week old pasta, apparently. Uh, yeah. Well, now, I, now I found you... out the hard way. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. But, uh, but I'm all right now. <laughs> yeah, so, I, it would it would have been it would have been odd if you would have missed the show and I had to do it solo. But yeah. uh, let's get right into it. We have uh, our most requested guest for Xbox Two Plus One, uh, the one, the only Colin Moriarty of Last Stand Media, Sacred Symbols, and all that. Uh, thank you so much for co coming on, co Colin. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I, it's good to be here with you guys. You guys have been very generous with your time with the Dukes on Last Stand, uh, so I'm very happy to give you my time, and I appreciate the invite. Oh, we love we love doing the Dukes. I think I've been on there maybe three or four times. And what a steal that you guys you you were able to get Lord Cognito. Just kind of, I know you've been doing ILP, but we really like uh, defining Duke is like blown up. They are they are probably my favorite xbox podcast to listen to so thank you um, uh I'm, I'm i'm really proud of them I, I don't we have a very decentralized company i don't the only thing i had to do with defining duke is i named it um otherwise they uh run the show on their own do whatever they want and they do a really really great job and i'm really proud of them and yeah the show the uh the show is really blown up because sacred symbols is the biggest playstation podcast but it seems like the Xbox space is so much more crowded. We often talk about that, and I don't know why that is. There's a lot of different theories as to why that is, but um, they have to clear their space, and they're doing it, and I'm proud of them. And I like the you... collaboration between all the different shows in that space, too, which is different than the PlayStation ecosystem. Yeah, we're all, we're all friends. Like, we all kind of started podcasting together back in 2015, 2016, using Google Hangouts. So everybody's, like, friends. So even though people have their own podcasts, we're all friends with each other, so everybody's like, yeah, I'll jump on your show. You jump on my show. Nobody views each other as competition and is like, I don't want that person to grow. It's, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, right? So, um, yeah, we're, it's, it's great. I, I, I don't know really much on the PlayStation side. Um, I don't really watch a lot of PlayStation podcasts, so I don't really know how there that aren't works. that many. I mean, Podcast Beyond is the big one over there or a big one. And of course, PS, I love you. But the thing about those is that I also was the co-host of those shows. Yes. Um, so, um, you say you so got I a monopoly on PlayStation. Park. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically the, I'm the only, I'm the person that has been on all three shows. I was co-host of beyond for many years and, um, I founded or co-founded PS. I love you. So, um, that's, I think that's makes it a little awkward is that there's a little more contention between us because of the different rosters that have been on these shows. Like Greg is on PS. I love you. And he was on beyond as well. So it's a little less kind over there, but I also think there's just. There just seems to be less of a fan space, like a, a smaller fan space where these smaller shows, not your show is huge, but smaller shows can begin and then blossom into something bigger. Um, I do think I'd like, like to see more competition on that side. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I was just going to chime in because like, it's still really fresh in my mind. Like when I was getting started in journalism and writing and, and podcasting and content creation and stuff. But even when I had like 200 followers on Twitter, Microsoft was kind of there. <laughs> you know saying like come come to gamescom we'll get you in backstage uh you know so you can get get pat jump the queues and play the games and talk to the devs and stuff like that i don't know if sony does that kind of stuff because on on their side um because i don't cover playstation so i don't know what the the pr cycles like there but i honestly feel like xbox has kind of xbox goes out of its way to nurture some of those grassroots shows and sort of try to elevate them and stuff i remember when phil spencer like maybe about eight years ago seven years ago something like that phil spencer did uh the inner circle podcast which n no longer exists sadly um and uh you know that i remember when phil spencer went on their sh their podcast and they had like two thousand subscribers or something at the time a few thousand subscribers if that and then, like phil went on and like it blew up their channel like and you know um 
So I I, th- I do think Xbox fosters some of that a little bit, but maybe it's because they have to a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I um I will say in my experience because I've been I've been a professional in the industry I guess for twenty one years, is that um Xbox has always been through Edelman and others like their PR firms very accessible. And uh, they used to, even when we did PS I Love You, I remember they sent us an Xbox One with Gears, what would that have been, four, five? One of those in 2015, 2016, somewhere in there. And uh, we, it must have been Gears 4, I would assume, because I've actually played the first three or four Gears. Um, and they, so even as PlayStation con- consumers, they were very eager to invite us to things. But the Sony was like that at one time, but not anymore. They have very Japanese sensibilities, much more conservative in business and in their approach. They just don't really seem to care. They talk to, they seem these days to like GQ, Wired for some reason, and maybe like USA Today and Washington Post. Um, but it's important to note on Sacred Symbols, it's not the true with Defining Duke because I let everyone do their own thing, but Sacred Symbols, we don't have any PR connections. We don't accept any early copies of games. We don't get review copies. We don't get preview copies. We don't get or accept invites to events or anything yeah. like that. So we basically have eschewed our contact with everyone um and that but that's just the way we run it because we feel like it gives us a lot of credibility that we buy our own games and play them at the same time as everyone else and just don't don't take any of the money and don't do endemic advertising we've left so much money on the table um yeah, by I, not by, by not allowing that but we just want to be kind of apart from it i do i do remember you telling me about that before and I, you know it's it's something like i often think about and I think about like how what would it be like if like more of us weren't slaves to Google the algorithm, you know, because like it's you kind of a lot of because I am a ju- I am a journalist and editor in that space, the blogging and, and all that kind of stuff, and we have like weekly SEO meetings and all that, and you know we have, we pay a lot of people to try and gamify the algorithms and and all that kind of stuff, um, and then like as we've me and Rand have kind of eased into Patreon. I do kind of feel like Patreon's such a healthier way of delivering content. I love it's our awesome. Patreon community, and it's and like even like when I went into finding Duke, the Patreon community from Last Time Media was also very friendly to me, even though I'm like oftentimes not the most popular guy in the PlayStation community. Last Time Media's Patreon community was very very kind to me when I was in Defining Duke, and uh, I do think it's health. It's it's a healthier content delivery mechanism. I do think that. I agree. I, and congratulations, by the way, on your guys' success, your growing success on Patreon. I believe that the more people that are on Patreon using it, getting users involved and comfortable, I think it's actually good for everyone. And uh, I've obviously made a great living on Patreon, and I'm grateful for it. But I agree with you in the sense that we are we do a show for our audience. It really does, Nothing else really matters. And if you set the... Like, for you guys, see, you're in a different situation, Jazz, because you're kind of still in media. So yeah. I think those connections are somewhat important. Like when I was editor at IGN and I was in charge of our PlayStation coverage for many years, I wouldn't have really had the option to do what I do now. So you have to kind of play that by ear, I guess. But by, dude, I'll tell you right now, like not having to sign NDAs, not being under embargo, not having to hit dates and do what, dude, it's such a relief. And, and the <laughs> audience, the audience does not care. At least ours yeah. doesn't. Like they do not care. In fact, I think a lot of audiences get frustrated. They'll probably experience this with Starfield. By the time they get their hands on Starfield, with the exception of post-release guide content, people will be on to the next game in media because they have to be. But yeah. people that get the game at the same time as everyone else will be playing it along with them. And I think that that's just a much more immersive way to create a community, um, which is why you guys have a lot of loyalty and we have a lot of loyalty and others do because we kind of talk about games a little bit differently. But I remember the SEO game and all that kind of stuff. I was there for you know in, in media for many, many years, and I'm grateful, frankly, that... Um, that I don't have to do it anymore because it's such a grind and it seems like it seems like it's such a I don't want to say a losing battle because that's not true. It's just like I don't know. I I think this is the way to go, and so I'm glad you guys are finding success yeah. here. It's yeah, definitely- we, we held off on Patreon for long. Jez, in fact, launched our Patreon without even talking to me. I didn't even know we were doing it. All of a sudden, it was there's a Patreon, and I'm like, what? What? You know, because I'm a YouTuber, so I got to play the YouTube game, right? I got to do the I got to do the clickbait, you know, the thumbnails. Uh, I got to bow down to Google's wishes because if, unless you're like Mr. Beast and even he kind of bows down to some of that, like you kind of have to play in that space, kind of over dramatize your titles. You know, like when, when Phil Spencer and Jim Ryan were going back and forth over the ABK stuff, I would have to use titles like PlayStation crying, right? Because it gets people, 
okay, they see that title and they want to click on it. And then Google it's an pushes click. it. Right. Um, so I had to play the game, but with the podcast, uh, we don't, I, I made the distinct decision when we started in the podcast, I wasn't going to clickbait anything on the podcast. The podcast titles are basically just the topics. Hey, Xbox, ABK deal, killer instinct, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where the videos themselves differently. Cause I believe the algorithm works separately. So the, the videos have to be clickbaited with the, with the titles and the thumbnails, but the podcast can just be the podcast and I don't have to worry. We use the same picture basically for each one. So anybody who comes to the channel knows what's, what's different and it's worked out well for us. You know, yeah, it, it is weird. Uh, that. Cause I, I always say me and Rand do back, we have back and forth and, you know, debating things like the webcams we were talking about before we went live. I was like, I ain't having to debate with Rand about Patreon. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. And I was like, hey, Rand, we've got a Patreon now. And, um, and then we were talking about, like, it'd be, it'd be nice if, like, 10 or 15 people signed up, but no, we're pushing 300 now, I think, which is amazing. That's awesome. And, That's um, great. And it is, it is, you know, content trailblazers like yourself where, you know, sort of showing the way forward for, for some of that content creation potential but uh yeah there's a speaking of content creation and you know and uh you know news cycles and and all that kind of stuff um what is what are what are some of the big sort of news discourse uh topics that you're currently interested in i know you said earlier before the show that you don't use social media very much but um is there anything like you, you're you putting on the docket for this week's sacred symbols already? Yeah, I mean, I think the the I'll write the show tomorrow. Funny enough, and um, I think that one of the there's like a a lot of nerves I think in the PlayStation community right now, and I I think I understand that just from a future perspective. We don't really know what's coming beyond Spider Man Two and Wolverine Hell Divers, and um, I think even though we know about Fair Games and Concord, I think that you know, in some way, I think players on PlayStation side are just a little hesitant and weirded out by how the console kind of continues to do really, really meteoric sales with very little to talk about in first and second party. And I think, um, so I'll probably tune into that this week with the audience and, and kind of hash that out more. And we just, we kind of similar to what I think you guys do later in the show when you bring in your inquiries, we try to, um, bring in listener inquiries to try to guide us as well. And mm. people love talking about, um, Right now, people, we did a question, like a really deep question about Starfield last week. People keep writing in and want to talk about Xbox stuff as well because things are so competitive and interesting and consolidative. But I think right now, the big things in PlayStation are people just waiting for Spider Man. We got a little bit more news today. I think people are curious about Helldivers. The rumor is that it will come out in October. That seems really weird to put it that out. That seems very odd. It seems yeah. like they're sending that game to die if it comes out in October. Yeah, I think it's a shame too because it looks awesome. And Arrowhead's been working on it for a long time. And it seems like it might, I don't want to say it was rebooted, but there was a piece of a trailer that leaked during the SCE era with like the addition, the different earlier PlayStation stamp in the beginning where they were going to announce it a long time ago, Helldivers 2. And I wonder if they really refined it and believe in it. And if that's the case, yeah, why would you want to release it so close to Spider Man? I think their argument might be it doesn't really matter. I think we're also making assumptions that. I assume it's going to be a $70 game, but is this going to be like some sort of game as a service with some sort of different approach? I don't know if that's going to be the thing. The thing I'm really fascinated about, and you guys might agree, are December releases because um, Crisis Core last year especially showed me that this could be a vibrant place to release a game, like a valuable game that people play. And so I would see Helldivers as maybe something you would want to yeah. release in early December instead. I know, but... an, is Helldivers Xbox... announced to be launching this year then? Yeah, they did announce it this year. Oh, okay. for, for this year. I know last year, um, High on Life did extremely well on Game Pass and Xbox on PC in December. Um, and there's even rumors that something like Stalker 2 could be launching in December of this year. So maybe there's going to be, uh, they're, they're starting to look at more of a, hey, instead of avoiding December, let's actually try to, uh, if we can have a game out that, that, that could work well, especially if hey, everybody's getting Xboxes for Christmas or playstations and everybody's getting game pass well we have a game for you in december that you can play right um i think i think that would work out well the the thing that i kind of gather about like you mentioned the playstation fans nervousness um stems to be like from around not knowing what's coming after spider-man but also the recent reports of 
PlayStation internally delaying games out of this past fiscal year and the, I guess the more focus on live service stuff, does that concern you like at all moving forward that a lot of PlayStation's games might be something you're not particularly interested in? Yeah. I mean, right now we're, ex- we're, I, I experienced that generally anyway, for instance, Gran Turismo was really big, right? And I don't play racing games. So that's like totally lost on me. So I have to kind of accept that maybe not everything will be for me, but Here's the way I look at the games as a service thing, and you guys might agree or disagree. I don't play them. I don't play online games at all. I play single player games. Um, and I own a, co-own a 2D studio. So I have very old school um, sensibilities, let's say. So I'm not necessarily like the, the common PlayStation gamer. I don't want to speak like I am. But I think if Sony can get, and we, we did this a few weeks ago, this math, like if Sony can get five games from first and second party out, or third-party exclusives, timed exclusives like Final Fantasy 16 per year, so four quarters. And one to two of those, so let's say a first and a second party each, are going to be a game as a service. So let's say fair games and something, some other random shooter or some other, I don't know, um, SOCOM clone or something. I think that's kind of a pretty safe place to be because they can start to kind of test the waters to see if they can make that games as a service money. They only need one of those games to really hit to make that kind of money or so they see it that way. And then... Players can have maybe a game a quarter or so to look for in the exclusive ecosystem from first or second party or, like I said, timed third party exclusives that I think will satiate everyone. Because the thing that doesn't bother me about PlayStation's games as a service approach is, A, what are they counting as games as a service? We know from their past finances, they, they count MLB The Show as one of those games, right? So they're, they're really, horizons are pretty broad in that sense. And so... Um, I look at their acquisitions, although I think that they were very rushed, of Haven and Fire Sprite and others as them trying to expand the family in such a way that it doesn't affect the single player centric studios like Santa Monica, Naughty Dog, etc. to kind of focus on those games still. But I also wouldn't be surprised as we're going to know with factions that these games as a service come from all these different studios. So I think there's just a nebulousness in some way. Um, it's exciting and nerve wracking because there there ha- there has to be games to announce and talk about. We just don't know what they are, so it's kind of the great unknown. And I don't think, in my experience, that PlayStation has really ever held their cards this close to their chest ever. And um, mm-hmm. I think that, like you said, in the in the in the um, finances, in the financial report for Q1, they note that they delayed some products. I would assume that one of those is factions, and uh, I don't know what the others would be. But we know that Bungie apparently is doing some sort of round. Robin sort of like going to every studio and kind of testing their games for longevity. And that could be the other cancellations of games we don't know about yet as well. So I don't know. It's, it's a strange time. Cause like I said, the console is doing really, really well, basically PS4 level sales and the first party games and second party games sell really well. Final fantasy 16, I think is pretty impressive at probably 4 million now considering the install base. Although I know square Enix is never happy about any of the games that they actually <laughs> sell. So, um, So I think if that makes sense to you, I think that there's just kind of a big question mark. And what's funny to people is we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to Spider-Man and to to Helldivers. And it's like, you certainly have to say something, right? Uh, You have to say something soon, I would assume, in the next couple of months, especially with the slim model PS5 coming out and Project Q and all the rest. So I've gone on there, but that's kind of my sense of the situation right now. I'm kind of, it's kind of inertial, like it's just moving. doesn't seem like there's any reason for it. I guess there are events coming up that there could possibly talk about upcoming stuff i suppose it's tgs although i don't know if sony's going to be there like i'm like i'm so unfamiliar with how playstation does things and how they announce things and how they sort of weave their you know their hype cycle you know because like you said they seem to sell regardless (laughs) you know it's it's sort of like playstation the ubiquitous kind of brand for a specific kind of gamer very much in the same way that Call of Duty is just the game everybody buys every year or FIFA's the the football game everyone buys every year. It kind of feels like a lot of people for a lot of people PlayStation is that kind of no-brainer kind of console purchase brand. To that end, um where do you where do you see, right? And I am like I've I've I get second-hand knowledge of your views about Xbox all the time. And you know, we we had we had a. I think my my very first interaction with you was based on assumptions that I had been fed via secondhand information. So I want to get it straight from you. Where do you see Xbox 
in this sort of competition like do you do you think of them as having like what role do you think xbox has or should have in the industry um and what would you like to see them do if anything you know and that's a broad broad question i just want to take on xbox broadly speaking it's a great question and i think that i separate xbox into a bunch of different component parts and the things that they do well, I think primarily have to do with services and kind of, um, well, let me use this as an, as an example. When the, and you guys will know this, is when the original Xbox came out, and this had come up on my show recently, when the original Xbox came out in 2001, it was considered pretty bold to put an ethernet port only on your console. And I remember cable internet at that time in the United States, and I'm sure it was like this in a lot of other parts of the world, was not that common. I was still using dial-up at that point. And I had a Dreamcast that was hooked up to the internet and so on and so forth. And I remember the writing and people kind of prognosticating about this being like, this is kind of crazy that they're doing this. They're forcing this situation where they're not going to have the, the high level of online users for Xbox Live that would launch in 2002, but they're making sure the fidelity for those that are there is really high. And I think that was a really smart move. And I think that the pioneering nature of services on Xbox from Xbox Live, I was an early Xbox Live user. I loved Rainbow Six Three, played some Halo 2 and other things like that. Um, and it was impressive. It was way ahead of what was going on on PlayStation 2. We kind of got a taste of it on Dreamcast, the idea that you can turn your console on without a game and something would happen other than like a menu or a management for your memory card was pretty revolutionary. And then when you go into Xbox 360, I was in college at the time and my roommate got an Xbox 360 in that fall of 2005 at launch. And I was obsessed with certain parts of it. I was like, this is so interesting. The removable hard drive achievements and the, really the structure of Xbox Live as we would come to know it today and how influential that later was on PSN. People will remember that when PSN launched on PS3 in 2006, the store, if you went to the PlayStation store, it would open in a browser. That's how backwards PlayStation was even compared <laughs> to Xbox with a year more uh, going. And so the adopt adoption of tr trophies and so forth in 2008, I think, was a sign that Microsoft gets a lot of those things right. And I think that... Um, they should be applauded for those kinds of things. I think where they're weaker is with games. And I don't know that this, this is obviously a subjective thing, but I also think that it's just true based on market perception. Um, Xbox 360 did really well, and it's a really interesting console and certainly dominated the offices at IGN. I mean, that was, it's so funny to see about, to read about IGN's so-called PlayStation bias now when, everyone at IGN played Xbox 360. I was like the only person, me and Greg were like the only people playing PlayStation um, that entire generation. And so I look at Microsoft's, first of all, you asked what place they should have in the industry. And I think that that's up to the consumer, obviously. But I am concerned by Game Pass. And I've made that really clear. I think that's a, a, I think that's a concern shared widely in game development and publishing. I think some people talk about it more openly than others. And I don't, I'm not crazy about Microsoft's consolidative moves considering, and this is controversial to a lot of people, but it's just the way I see it is that I don't see Microsoft as a creative company first. 8% um, of their revenue comes from gaming and 25% of Sony's revenue comes from gaming while 10% of revenue of Sony comes from music and another from movies and TV. They're just a different kind of company. And so I think that they have better creative energy and juice clearly. And I think the same is true of Nintendo. And so when I see that the, the firm making the weakest games over generations consolidating, that makes me really nervous for the creativity of those firms on one hand, and also the subscription model for new products, which I think is just unsustainable. And Microsoft's really the one pushing that. So that's why they've been in my focus, not because they can't do whatever they want. They can, of course, bend the arc towards them if they want. But I just think these things will have deleterious effects that people aren't looking at in the mid and long term. And I think that these are thoughts that are especially shared by people in the know in the industry well yeah. all right on, well, I, so, <clears throat> hang on hang on i, I guess are you gonna okay i'm gonna go, go first go. Rand, okay all right down because because there's a lot to un, there's a lot to unpack there's a lot in, to unpack there. statement there yeah, um so. yeah just for sure like i want to first of all i want to say like with regards to um you said that xbox um you associate services with xbox in that context doesn't that make ABK the perfect purchase for them in a way? Or are you talking about like consolidation that could potentially occur beyond 
ABK or do you or, or were you t referring to things like Bethesda previously? Because like I think ABK like pretty hardcore aligns with what Microsoft's been doing in like the sense of Sea of Thieves service game really big, Flight Simulator service game really big, Forza Horizon thirty two million players really big, and Minecraft and so on and so forth, and like that's pretty much what ABK does right now. So when you talk about consolidation, like, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. I think that in consolidation, I look at it from three different perspectives. I think there's like the legal perspective, which is not a perspective I care about. And is in fact, I think a dead end. And we've seen that with the way the deal has cleared in most places. I think really the UK is the only sticking point now. And um, uh, I had Matt, that guy, Matt Stoller, the anti-monopolist on my show, and he was making the legal case, but I don't know that I necessarily agree with that legal case because um, I think consolidation, I used Heinz and Kraft as an example in the United States when they merged. I'm like, that merger was worth almost twice as much and is an actual food product on like conglomerate. And we didn't give a shit about that. So why do we care about Xbox buying Microsoft or Microsoft buying uh, Activision? It doesn't really make any sense. His argument is kind of like, you have to start somewhere, I guess. And so I don't make the legal argument, but the other two arguments I think are economic and creative. And um, I think in, the ter in terms of both the economic perspective and the creative perspective, I would be concerned about Xbox consolidating anyone because I think that they haven't shown a propensity compare in comparison to Nintendo and Sony of home growing stuff. And so I don't feel like their energy other than their money is going to bring much positive to those places. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and then, of course, the economic realities of consolidation. I just people always ask me, Jez and, and, and Rand, like you guys will probably get these questions a lot, too, from your audience. Like, who should Sony buy and what should so and I'm like, they shouldn't buy anyone. I don't want them to buy anybody. <laughs> you know, like I can't want like, them to buy Square Enix. <laughs> No, I mean, Jez, they, Jez, they, wants, Jez wants Sony to buy Square Enix. He's been saying yeah, that just, for years now. I yeah. just don't, I think that's a yeah, possibility as well, but I just don't, I think that, okay, I don't like this, I don't like this like assumption of consolidation as being mm. the inevitable. And I don't, like you said, like buying something after ABK. I wonder what you guys think of this. My theory on this is if Microsoft buys another sizable entity, they're going to have an optical turn on them in the community. And you can already see it in, like, Larian would be the most recent one where everyone's like, oh, Microsoft should buy Larian. And everyone's like, why? Like, <laughs> what are you saying? Like, what? And I think that if they go and try to buy another sizable publisher, you know, Sony's never bought a publisher, per se. Um, and that's what makes it so different. And this is now the second major publisher that Microsoft has gone and bought. And so I think that there's just, see, the thing is, is that I think there's a lot of short-term gain for Microsoft, and I think it's great for Game Pass, and I think Game Pass is a steal for the audience. I'm concerned about the mid and long term, and I say that not only as a media analyst, I guess, but really more as a developer. I own, like I said, I co-own a developer, and the economics are fraught out there, man, and I'm, I'm worried about bending the arc and interrupting the so-called mm -hmm. theory of price, like the supply and demand, like why does something cost a certain amount? Um, Microsoft seems to be tipping the scale by using monies um, that aren't necessarily gotten from games or the gaming industry and kind of flooding or potentially flooding with the industry with a, a new um, economic model, very similar to what we saw with early iPhone. And we can pretend that these silos exist separate of each other, but we all know that that's not true. The race to the bottom and microtransactions and all that kind of stuff came from iOS and they are everywhere now. And so I worry about, again, another race to the bottom or another removal of value. And I think that those are kinds of the things that Microsoft represents right now, not because it's a bad thing, but because that's what they need to do to survive. And that's inherent to their model of getting subscribers to their, um, to their, yeah. to their console. And that's why I was, when people are like, where's the Starfield advertising? I'm like, wouldn't you imagine that since they want you to subscribe to Xbox, that they would want you to get close to the date so that you get the most value they're not trying to sell you necessarily on a pre-order and all that kind of stuff in other words they're working on a, on a different vertical and i think that that's really relevant and i'm really concerned so i love thinking about the mid and long term and i don't think that the ramifications are good and i'll underline that there's almost no company that sony could buy that makes any sense right like there if if you want them to buy things that or if the audience would want them to buy things that make no sense there's a lot of targets for that i, su I yeah. suppose like some of it does boil down to perspectives because I do completely hear what you're saying. Like, um, and when you're, you know, you talk about the potential, like any disruption has a potential to go, to go in a bad way, you know, 
Um, and, you know, the disruption uh, ha has consequences. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Like, I'm a Spotify subscriber, and I have been since God knows when, since forever. I no longer buy CDs. And we often hear from music artists that Spotify has been really bad for the industry, supposedly. Like, but there's still artists sort of changed and moved with the times and they em ended up embracing it, embracing virality, embracing TikTok and all that kind of stuff. And they still sell out concerts and they still make money from merch and stuff like that. And I don't think Metallica's too upset these days about how much money they're making and all that kind of stuff. So like sometimes like there is disruption, but it it's, it's things like evolve and, do you know what I'm kind of getting at? Yeah, like, yeah. It doesn't but, necessarily but yes, have would... to be bad. Do you, do you think you there's would... any chance that it could end up being a good thing? Or um, you... Yeah, and I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, um, no, no. It, uh, I think, well, first of all, I think that it could be a good thing. I don't really see, from a creative standpoint, any argument for consolidation. Like, if you're just looking at it, not economically and not in terms of legality, but just in terms of creativity. In my opinion, you'd want as many independent firms as possible, preferably even privately held and not on the market. And oh, then they'll be, sell themselves later. Ideal. Yeah. That, and so that's, that's the way I see it. But Jez, wouldn't you agree that the music industry is interesting and unique in that there are other avenues? My, my best friend, Ramon, who's on our show sometimes, is a touring musician. He plays with a band, Bad Rabbits, and, and all these other things. And, um, and we went to college together, and he was a music industry major there. And he always brings up that though there was a time really in the 80s and, and into the 90s where there were big record deals, that everyone always made their money touring. And the only, ad the only adaptation that really needed to happen in music was to kind of funnel the touring. Like So, so Spotify, I'm a big Spotify guy too. I've had Spotify for over 10 years. Love it. But I buy band merch. I go to see shows and go to festivals and do all those different things where they've always made their money anyway. And the theory that I take, take into this is that you can't really look at video games like that because there is no second or third, let's say secondary or tertiary market for them to make serious money. The biggest money will always come from the a la carte sales a few weeks from purchase. And there's really nothing else to do to make that money back. And that the argument could very easily be that therefore those games shouldn't exist. But that's why I think where things are so interesting with music because music managed to survive and actually thrive by leaning into the components of the industry or the business that always made the most money anyway, but were the most complicated. That's why if you look now, there are many, 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 many more live shows and festivals now than there have ever been. Yeah. And that's because people want to go make money. Shit, we do live shows, right? Um, so I, I just think that the comparison is apt in some way. You and I share that affinity for digital music libraries, but I think it hasn't upended the economics and it's kind of given us a way out because, well, they never really made money on music anyway. Yeah. You know, a lot of these bands, they made money when you went and saw them. Well, so, I mean, kind, I, I kind of see what you're saying, but like the, this sort of plays into the assumption that um, there won't be any a la carte sales in a Game Pass world. Like Microsoft's, Microsoft tries to keep, unlike Spotify, which is literally every song in existence game pass has this sort of rotate in rotate out thing where like every few months a game rotates out with a discount and then you buy it like i literally bought octopath traveler recently because played in game pass didn't finish it so never finish anything according to rand yeah you don't finish anything <laughs> and then he had a game pass discount so i bought it so i could keep my save and play it, keep playing it later not that you lose your save after it exits game pass but like i i knew i knew one day maybe I'll finish Octopath Traveler. Do you think, like, if Microsoft sort of hears these concerns from yourself and, as you say, uh, widespread concerns from publishers who are presumably are talking to Microsoft, can't they curate it in a way where it's, like, it's beneficial for everyone? Like, Sea of Stars, for example, they're taking a bag from PlayStation for, for PlayStation Plus. They're taking Xbox Game Pass money as well. That gives them sort of cash flow security in the in the run-up to launching their game and that'll i mean this is this is what microsoft says this is how microsoft markets the model like game pass will give them some virality and then people who just don't want a subscription service they will go and buy the game potentially is yeah that... this is 
I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, just, it's basically like, like, could, could, is there is there a way where Microsoft could curate this Game Pass to assuage your, some of your fears about it? Yeah, I think. Well, it's so funny you bring. It's so funny that you. Well, not that you bring this up. Of course, this was going to come up, but that recently I've taken a sojourn. I do like once a year, just go on my. my so my fiance, who you um, talk to, Micah, she's an Xbox gamer um, first and Switch as well. She doesn't really play on PlayStation at all, and so we have a few Xbox Series Xs or a couple in the house. And once a year or so for our retro podcast um, knockback, my brother and I try to go play an Xbox exclusive, and uh, I just played through Halo Two. And when I went on, um, I had to update it and everything because I hadn't been on in a while. And then I went to the store and I, I, I bought it for $40. And I was like, man, what? It's brutal <laughs> like to stick by your principles when you can just get Game Pass and just do this. But I kind of want to um, – I, I was trying to kind of analyze it from like, okay, well, it really is just worth it to do it this way because you get all these Halo games and you're not going to play consecutively. So you're going to get in for Halo 2 for a month, pay your 15 bucks, and then have to come back later and try to make the math work that way. But I think what we can all agree upon, and the data isn't really unclear about this, is that a la carte sales on Xbox are in decline, like, precipitously. And this is one of the things that I think frustrates me about um, about this theory that PlayStation has all these bespoke exclusives from third parties, not ig or ignoring the fact that many of those exclusives are just voluntary, that they don't want to publish on Xbox because they don't feel like they're going to make money there. Not because Xbox gamers don't exist, but because Xbox gamers are trained more and more to wait. And again, there's nothing wrong about from this from a consumer standpoint. Guys, if I was just a games consumer, I would be happy as a pig in shit with Game Pass because it's a great value. I don't. It's like going to the store and buying beef and being like, "Well, it came from wherever." And most of us deal that way, you know, deal with that, or like, "How is this wheat grown for this bread or whatever?" But if you think about it at a deeper level, I think that you realize that. There is um, a declining a la carte market that is declining to such a degree that a lot of publishers simply don't publish on um, on Xbox because they don't feel like they can make any money there. Because people think it's easy and cheap to publish on platforms, but it's neither easy nor cheap. And you have to have some sort of guaranteed return. You don't publish, you're not a AAA publisher putting a game on Xbox to sell 10,000 copies. I mean, that's just not even worth anything at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those kinds of things become more relevant to the point where I, I think um, during the F, the uh, FTC hearing, they showed a placard from where it was like, this is how many exclusives Microsoft has. This is how many exclusives PlayStation has. And I'm like, I bet you 70% of those exclusives are completely voluntary and are, are simply being counted as exclusive because they exist, as if Sony goes around and gives money to 900 games on a platform to stay off of the other platform. This is okay. happening because... There's a there's an opportunity cost to that method, and if you're not in the gated community or not invited into it, then you have to sell your games a la carte, in which you'll realize that there's a declining market. So I think that that makes perfect sense to me. But I think from a from a like you said, from a consumer's perspective, you can't argue with Game Pass. It's not really the consumer's problem to worry about it, and I wouldn't dispute that at all. I well, I, I, sorry, I I just I, I'm gonna get Rand speak because I'll be speaking a lot. Go on, Rand. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things I want to touch on, but I'll go to the most recent one. The declining a la carte sales, where exactly is that info coming from? Because like, when I look at Microsoft's financials, from even dating back from when Phil Spencer took over the brand in 2014 and they were pulling 7 billion sales, they're up to, you know, this past fiscal year was their second best year ever at like 15.5 billion is and nowhere in any of their financials or anything they talk about is there any mention of declining a la carte sales and even when we talk about game pass and how it could cannibalize stuff it's i, I sort of feel like what's really cannibalizing a lot of stuff is the free to play model not game pass because free to play and game pass are kind of at odds of one another right you don't see there's no free to play games in game pass but even still i i just don't i just Maybe I'm out of the loop, but I would love to know where like the that whole, you know, games don't sell well on Xbox thing is coming from. Do you, well, I think you can you, get it from both. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I'm, I, can, I'm I, can't, I can't see you guys, so I'm having a hard time right, right, knowing right. when you're stopping. Blame. I don't mean to keep cutting you off. Blame you, Rand, you keep, blame you can, Rand you can for keep, the lack of webcam. You can keep you can keep on cutting <laughs> us cutting us off when, whenever your response is ready. But I'm just I'm just I just don't know where that data comes from. I, granted, I don't have access to special industry analysis at like gameindustry.biz or whatever 
And I know like the physical charts of the UK when Christopher Dring posts them every single week, they do look dire for Xbox, but it's just physical only in a UK market when Xbox is basically mostly digital and we don't really get those numbers. I'm just curious to know what where you think that's coming from. PlayStation is mostly digital too, though. So I, I think that those kind of wash out. I don't think that there's, I don't, I wouldn't believe that there would be a noticeable number of uh, fewer uh, a la carte purchasers in digital in the digital ecosystem on either console. I think that they're kind of the same. Wouldn't you say? I don't know. I mean, even, even if we use Christopher Dring as like, cause they're the only ones who talk about physical in that sense. Right. And he even mentions that Xbox is like 80% physical and PlayStation is like 60%. So there's like a 20% difference between them because people always freak out when like oh my gosh Street Fighter 6 sold all this on PlayStation and nothing on Xbox and then when the actual all you know all the data comes in with digital and physical it's a lot closer to what the numbers actually should be between the disparity between the consoles and I, I don't know I sort of like the whole Game Pass stuff to me I, I don't really think it'll ever be that much of a disruptor simply because you look at this holiday and you look at all the biggest games coming out, like Alan Wake 2, uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage, um, any like Lords of the Fallen, uh, any of the big games coming out, or any of the big, big games that have come out this year, like Resident Evil 4 and Hogwarts Legacy and Diablo 4 and all that sort of stuff. None of them came out in Game Pass. And outside of Diablo 4, I don't think any of them will come to Game Pass in the future, right? So the fact that Xbox has a curated list of games that only come into game pass and for the most part it's not triple a where an xbox user knows like hey if i want to play on like two i'm gonna have to buy it i could wait two years three years four years it could never come to game pass but in that time maybe it got cheap enough where they'd buy it anyways this isn't like spotify to me at least where every single song in existence and every single new song that will ever be made is going to a subscription service it kind of reminds me of the Hyper Bowl, and I don't know if you remember this, Colin, of essentially back when Steam was starting to get big and they had the Steam sales and people were freaking out about how insane those sales were. I remember articles talking about how, oh, Steam sales are training PC players to just wait for sales. This could really have a huge impact on mm. full price releases down the road. Mm. And what ended up happening was it didn't. In fact, more people buy games on PC than they ever have before, and nobody really talks about Steam sales anymore, right? I, I sort of feel that's maybe the future of Game Pass, whereas, you know, you mentioned previously, a lot of publishers don't like it. I know Jim Ryan said that in, in his deposition, but I don't really believe him. I don't really <laughs> believe that, because I, I can look at it with my own eyes and see that, like, Ubisoft's all up in Game Pass, EA's all up in Game Pass. Sega's all up in Game Pass. Capcom just launched Exo Primal in Game Pass as well as a new game. Like, you can look at all the publishers and you can see they're all in Game Pass in some manner. And the ones that were the guards of the old way, like Take-Two, ABK, they weren't there. Although Take-Two has even dabbled in it. Grand Theft Auto Five is on Game Pass and is maybe even some of the reasons why xCloud right now has a whole bunch of different queues. I know that's a lot because I've been waiting to like, you know, Jez has been going on, which is fine, but the, I, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I just want to know because it, it, it seems like you're presenting this like scenario, which could be awful uh, for developers and the industry, but I just don't see it going that way, mainly because I don't see Xbox becoming that powerful, like to change the, 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 parad the paradigm shift of, everything becoming a subscription service or all this happening, Xbox would need to significantly just be way beyond PlayStation to the point where everybody bends to their will. And I just don't ever see that happening. As much as I'm an Xbox fan and love the brand to get bigger and, and better, I just don't see that ever happening in the future. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but um, yeah. Well, I want to go back, just so you don't think I was ignoring your first thing and you'll remember in a half an hour and it'll be a non sequitur, so... It, which is like, where do I get the data The about like Xbox's declining sales? You're right that it's all, well, it's not all because I, I talk to people behind the scenes too. And I also, again, see how my own games sell on across platforms. But, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is anecdotal, but I think it's powerful anecdotal evidence. I do think that the Xbox uh, UK sales are really powerful evidence of what 
of not a complete erosion of all Xbox sales, but a decline in Xbox a la carte sales. And you know what's the most interesting to me? That And this comes up, people will take these pictures. And again, these are all anecdotes is when a big game comes out. So let me think of an example. Maybe it was like Diablo or something like that. Um, and I know this was true with Elden Ring last year. I remember seeing them is that people will be like, I'm a manager at GameStop. So again, just an anecdote. Here are the pre-orders for a la carte sales in Elden Ring or whatever. And it's just stacks and stacks of PlayStation games and then four Xbox games. That's not a representation of the equivalent player base. That's a representation of how they interact with their games. And so I just, that's to your, I just didn't want you to think I was ignoring you. That's, no, 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 yeah, yeah. That to me is, I think, pretty potent. Yeah, but, even, but even Microsoft's financials don't even, like if, if, if the this full price sales were way down, they wouldn't be making more money than they ever made before, right? Well, I don't it's know. Not like, it's not like Game Pass is making that much to cover up the difference. I don't it's think people- so. But, I, but that's what I was going to say is they don't really, I haven't, dove into the newest quarterly report for Microsoft, but typically they don't really dissect right at that granular level. They'll have like, don't they have like games and services revenue generally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hardware revenue generally? Well, yeah, they, well, they don't really give the number. You you can get the overall number of like how much they made in the last fiscal year compared to the previous ones. And sort of like, okay, we, we sort of know how many Game Pass subscribers there are and how much money they potentially make off that and then how much they made off PC. We know they ain't making much on mobile because they ain't in mobile yet, right? And they're making anything off cloud. So it's kind of like, okay, the rest of the money has to come from here. And yeah, there's microtransactions and all that stuff from the biggest games in the industry like Fortnite, but where's the rest of the money coming from? And it's it's only grown since Phil Spencer's taking over. It's only basically doubled uh in the time that he's led xbox so i i mean i know anecdotal evidence can be a powerful like you see it and you're like oh man that's happening all over the world but then sometimes we talk about xbox series x stock where like by me it's not existent but then i'll get pictures from fans who are like i went to the store and there was 10 here Mm. and sometimes you can get maybe the wrong impression now granted you, you say you're talking to developers behind the scenes i don't talk to any developers behind the scenes but i have seen posts by developers talk about how much better their games have sold on Xbox versus PlayStation. Now, I'm sure there's probably true that some games sell better on PlayStation and Xbox. So Do you have any examples of that? I'd love to know. I know Mike Rose. Are these off the record? Mike Rose. No, Mike Mike Rose, who made like the senders, has talked about that. Senders. Uh, Yeah, I just want want, want to just look. I I believe you completely. I would love to know more about this. I'm going to write. I'm just writing Um, my notes. when, when um, When I was talking earlier about virality, like a lot of that, conversation about virality game pass generating word of mouth leading to a la carte sales a lot of that comes from mike rose who, who makes descenders he says like we put descenders in xbox game pass and people started talking to their friends about it they don't want game pass but they want the, they want to play descenders and they end up getting it like that i believe there's been other developers talk about that as well i think no this that- is good i want to reach out to, i want to mm-hmm. reach out to this person i i um yeah so i i think i first of all I want to be clear about this about Game Pass too. Is that I'm specifically talking about day one releases on Game Pass. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think the idea of a gaming subscription model is not only great, but that it's probably essential. And and Microsoft, see, I was saying earlier about Xbox Live and all these things. Microsoft should be commended from the Game Pass perspective in this, making this idea that you could have a back catalog of games that actually does give you that secondary and tertiary income that would otherwise not exist. And for older games, I think that that's awesome. And Game Pass is completely dominant in that space. Although PS Plus does pretty well, I don't. I subscribe to PS Plus specifically for cloud saves. Otherwise, I wouldn't even have it. So I don't have the higher PS Plus tiers where the games actually are. Can but I, can I just interject really quick? Yeah, because you brought it up. What do you think of PlayStation not reporting PlayStation Plus numbers anymore? I think that they probably understand that the numbers are going to plateau and maybe even go down. Because I think I don't know if you guys agree with this, but I think there was probably a a noted. Uh, uptick in subscriptions for both game pass and ps plus over covid and the oh, optical yeah. game the, there's like going to be an optical situation where you're going to have to account for that so instead of announcing numbers you're just going to stop talking about them and i think microsoft might have done the same thing i don't think microsoft has said anything about game pass numbers in a couple of years right so they yeah. Said, yeah they haven't they haven't said anything since they announced their intention to acquire uh activision back in january of 2022 at, and they said then it was 25 million yeah so i think so sony is then. I think Sony is literally just trying to keep the numbers out of their reports. It's very similar to when Sony has numbers, sometimes they don't share their numbers. So like, we don't know how well PSVR two is sold. For instance, obviously it's bombed, but we don't know to, to what extent, but back in the day, you might recall 
when Vita started to sell poorly, which was pretty quickly, they just started folding the numbers into PSP's numbers. Mm -hmm. And they would just report handheld numbers. And that's how they would hide them. So the honest answer is, is I think they're just trying to hide the PS Plus numbers because I don't think that they're going to go up. Um, I've I been think saying that, for a yeah. long time that I sort of feel the people out there who are willing to pay for multiplayer is capped. There's only so many people that are willing to pay for multiplayer. And I think PlayStation Plus is still viewed as just that's how you get multiplayer access. And I think there's just a set number of people who will pay for that. And I think the only way for PlayStation to really increase PlayStation Plus, and you may hate this, is by putting PlayStation's first party games day one in, in the sub. Yeah, but like they'll, never, were... they'll never do that, I don't think. Or if they do that, I think that that's a concession that things have really changed behind the scenes, you know? So, you don't, just... so yeah. when you say never, I mean, do you mean their single player stuff or like their multiplayer stuff? Because I think Herman Hulst has made mention that uh, well, maybe not. I, I was this. That's a whole different discussion about PC. Um, I would say I would just say they're big first and second party single player games. Like I guess you could imagine a game like Helldivers maybe going to PS Plus, but I just don't see what they really gain from that because they still have a very healthy a la carte game buying ecosystem. We're all gonna find that out when Spider Man comes out. Yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm expecting Spider Man to be the fastest selling PlayStation release ever. Yeah, I that's think it will. Expectation. I, I, I think probably per capita that's true. I think the numbers will be hamstrung a little bit by the the console still will be below 50 million at that point, probably at 45 million or so. So who knows? You would imagine maybe a 20 or 25% attach rate for a game that big, but I don't really know. But I do think that they... I was just having this conversation with Michael Mumbauer, actually, um, who used to work at Sony for a really long time. And the, the, there's this idea that they're already so close to the vest with these AAA games that taking any risk by removing that almost guaranteed let's say you release some triple a you know sucker punch game and it sells seven million copies or whatever like they they really rely on that to just eke out a profit and then move on to the next game and so making sacrifices to the tune of two or three or four hundred million dollars which is what these games cost now behind the scenes you know it's crazy the last of us part two a ps4 game cost 220 million dollars so you know how much these games are costing now this generation in the PlayStation first party. I just think that they look at that and they think that I think it would be kind of suicidal for them to consider that. And I think that if they did do that with their big games, like Naughty Dog's next, like Uncharted, the new Uncharted one with, Ka you know, Cassie Drake or whatever, and it comes out on PlayStation Plus, I think that's a concession that things have changed, really, really changed in Microsoft's favor. Um, but I think but that... How would that yeah, change, sorry. how would that change be, actually happen? Like, would Microsoft have to be so far ahead of PlayStation that PlayStation would have to change the way they do it because even like the most generistic optimist takes of the abk deal and everything don't really see microsoft don't really see xbox suddenly becoming way more powerful than playstation though well this is where we get so. into the, this is where we get into the mid and long term and where i think that the the concerns come from because again again i think in the short term you're right i i think I thought Phil Spencer's um conversation with kind of funny was really fascinating from so many different angles but i really loved how he kind of put a point on an obvious thing, which was that PS4 Xbox one generation loss was catastrophic um, to the brand and really set them back. And that's a, a mid to long term problem. So from my perspective, you look at a thing like game pass. And again, this is more from a developer perspective than maybe from a game playing perspective. Cause I, again, I just don't know that it's the consumer's problem to worry about this sort of stuff. And I understand that, but you look at, um, the arc being bent by Microsoft. So they get Activision after all the PlayStation co contracts run, they get Call of Duty on Game Pass, right? Day one. Um, and then it starts to create, and, and they, again, this is just one of many outcomes, right? But it starts to suggest that, well, wow, this is really becoming a very valuable way to do business. Consumers can't avoid doing business like this. You look at the different sales numbers and the, the gravity of Game Pass as an offering as it gets more and more power and, and so on and so forth then I think that concession, like I argued, would be necessary because Sony would not feel it would be necessary any longer to compete on a game-by-game -game basis, but on a subscription-by-subscription -subscription basis. And I think that, by the way, they already kind of understand that. I just think that they're hoping that it becomes a legacy product, and that's it. And if it's if it's a legacy product with like some random, like Sea of Stars, like you guys said, is coming to PlayStation, that's really cool. Again, that's only at the that's not on the PS Plus essential level, though. 
So really only 12 or 13 million people are even going to get access to that game. They're already not really willing to do that kind of business in a broader sense. So I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's that's what I'm talking about, about the mid and long term. The many games, if you game it out, I think that that's one way that it can be done. But there is the other direction, Rand, which you said, which is like nothing happens, like the status quo remains and both exist next to each other. I just don't know how that happens because we haven't really seen that. We, uh, Jez brought up music and CDs. Like I haven't bought a CD in many years either. No one really does anymore. Um, and the ramifications of that are what they are. So I don't know if that makes sense. I'm trying to, I'm trying to answer everything you're saying. I don't know if I'm yeah, doing, yeah. It, yeah. doing it. No, well. no, no, I, no, it, it, perfect. The, it's are, perfect. These are kind of like multi multifaceted yeah. uh, discussions because the, the ABK acquisition obviously is a major talking point for Xbox. And that kind of ties into Xbox Game Pass, which is also a major talking point for Xbox and and that kind of stuff. Um, it also ties into, you know, Colin, you said Last of Us Part Two was $220 million. Right. And then you can get into the whole aspect of Sean Layden said a little bit after he left PlayStation that the AAA space was kind of unsustainable. Totally. And maybe Game Pass helps with that. Maybe... You know, with all the studios that Microsoft has and the ability to be like, okay, we have this overarching service where all our games go into, all this money comes into that we can still sell uh, individually that we want or with microtransactions and DLCs that we can absorb the cost of rising expenditures of AAA games because we have this to, to fall back on where other companies uh, who don't do that might not be able to. And you look at Sony and they're like, okay, we might be making less single player games and they're, they're making more money and they're taking longer. So in the meantime, we need to find uh, ways to resolve this or uh, you know, improve it. So, okay, we're, we're increase the price, $10, uh, explore PC as an avenue to get more revenue. Although I think they should be doing day one on PC. I think it's only beneficial. You only make more money. Granted, it might, you might sell less consoles, but I think, your games become even bigger if you do it on, on, on day one on PC, but that's a different uh, like whole scenario. And then um, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, um, <laughs> okay. What, what was I talking about jazz? I just, I just completely blanked. You were talking about how um, man, you're making me blank now. Oh, w w essentially because games take so much longer to make, yeah, and, yeah, and they're more Jim expensive. Ryan even said he wants hundreds of millions of people to play his games, mm -hmm. but essentially you're all you're just always selling the same game to the same people, right? right. Spider Man Two right. was going to sell probably maybe a little bit more, maybe the same amount to the same exact people it sold to in 2018, and, but even though the cost have risen, so how do you bu buffer yourself against those costs? You know, like it yeah, would get to a point where AAA games are just we we can't do this anymore and we have to or search for different to, avenues or we have to raise the price again of the mm. games because they've hit mm. 70 dollars now right in america right which i think is uh, so you guys are speaking to the a, a really fundamental and really wonderful tension to talk about because it's so vital to this question which is about value right and about perceived value and what value means does value mean 100 hours does value mean 4k lifelike graphics with ray tracing does value mean accessibility i mean jez you had brought up the pricing in games i say this and it's not popular in my audience but i say it, games are too cheap um 70 dollars for a triple a game like final fantasy 16 is a steal considering what it costs to make and how much entertainment and value you're getting out of it this is something that i think john garvin speaks about the guy who wrote siphon filter in, on days gone a friend of mine when he speaks about the idea that people will gladly sp spend $15 to go see Oppenheimer, which is a three hour film, and they'll balk at a $70 price for a 25 or 30 hour game. And that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And he's right. <laughs> it, it simply doesn't make any sense. We've undervalued games to such a degree that we expect to pay so little of them for so little for them. You guys will remember during the cartridge era. I always bring this example, these two examples up for my audience, and I think they'll resonate with your audience. I remember going into Toys R Us in 1994 as a middle schooler and paying $80 USD for Final Fantasy III, Final Fantasy VI on SNES. And I remember Fantasy Star 4 on Genesis in 1995 being $100 USD. 
Yeah, and I remember. Um, I remember distinctly when I was a kid going into a game shop and uh, Majora's Mask was eighty quid or something, which is that's like a hundred dollars. Right, my parents and, were and, and, like, and these are having that. And the, and these are unadjusted sums right like yeah um I, that's why i always love seeing circulars and like advertisements for games i'm not saying that those games should have cost that much a lot of the cost of those games was how specialized the production for cartridges were and all of that and chipsets and i get all of that but the point i'm trying to make is that when you're when you have a team again like square enix business development three or whatever unit three and they spend all of this time five six years on this game that's 60 or 70 hours to platinum probably actually more like 100 because you have to beat it twice to platinum but let's say 70 hours to complete in 100 percent capacity and people are like oh 70 dollars i'll wait till it's on sale i'm yeah. like man we are effed if this is well, the if this is the mentality in, in the triple a sense and i look at a game like Baldur's gate which was what 60 and i'm like that's a fucking steal dude people should really understand how good they've got it and that that 10 dollar increase that sony kind of bit the bullet on the sad reality is that inflation wiped that out so now they're just back at square one. Well, and why not do day one PC, P, PC then, Colin? Why not release the next God of War on PC as well as... Because they want to sell consoles. It, they well, sell I know consoles. they want to sell consoles, but then you, you imagine how much more copies of God of War you could sell if you, if you also on day one, if you sold on PC at the same time. Instead right, of Ratchet but, and Clank coming two years later and nobody really caring because nobody really cares about late, late ports in general. Right. Um, I... I like people joke about Horizon Forbidden West and how it was completely overshadowed by Elden Ring, right? Because Elden Ring launched a week mm -hmm. week after. I have I have a feeling if Horizon was also on PC day one, I don't necessarily think that happens. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think first of all, I, I I'm thank you for bringing up Horizon. I I'm a one of the very rare pro, co, proponents of Horizon Forbidden West. I think it's arguably the most AAA game I've ever played in my entire life. It's amazing, and I'm I'm glad that at least it, it got some shine. Um, but here's what you're ignoring, I think, Rand, is like Sony looks at it, and I think this perspective does make sense, at least in their current mentality, which is, yes, we would get the short-term gain of selling a game on Steam. Maybe we even have a special deal with Steam where we do 80-20 or whatever, right? And so we sell a couple million copies of the game. But if we sell your, you a PS5, then we simply get 30% at the very least of everything you do on it forever, you know? And so they, yeah. they, just, want you, they just want you to buy the console, and it's just that simple. And that's that I think is a major divergence from Xbox's strategy. And again, w another suggestion of why you would necessarily see a decay in, say, sales on a platform as opposed to a platform that's really saying, like, no, you still really, really do need to buy things here. And mm -hmm. as long as they can ride that, I think that they will. But I think that that vital Sony without that extra money from Sony's not making money on their first and second party games. I mean, we saw that from at least recently, we saw that from the most recent Q1 financials, where I think they sold 55 million games and only 6 million were first party. Well, yeah, so, well, I mean, that's kind of the whole, what people don't understand is people don't buy these consoles for first party. Right, that's what kind of, that's what kind of, that might be the differentiator, but it's not what, there's not simply not enough games for you to only play first party, unless you're really weird, you know? Well, um, I mean, I, the thing is, right, the, one, of, one of the issues with this whole discussion is, is that mm. we're, we're talking about it from a generational perspective. We're talking about single player games that offer these massive AAA experiences like Horizon, like God of War and so on and so forth. I like this summer, I've been back in England because I usually live in Germany with my girlfriend, but I've been visiting family in England. I spent a lot of time with my cousins who are all Gen Z, right? And they don't even know what Game Pass is. But they have like no, they have no intention of ever buying a console because they think the very the concept of paying for a game is ridiculous. So like they're they're all up in Genshin Impact on PC. They're all up on, on Roblox and all the games you can get on there. They're all playing um, uh, Honkai Star Rail free game, uh, whatever. But they still they subscribe to these games so they can get the free gacha rolls and stuff like that. And they they think they think the idea of buying a console is a boomer thing <laughs> essentially you know and i think i think like when i think about services like playstation plus and xbox game pass and like when rand rand saying like he doesn't see game pass being that disruptive after this summer like spending so much time with with my cousins and stuff who are you know i show i show them I, like the kind of games we play and they just think they're silly you know <laughs> hmm. i'm like i'm like what, what do you mean Baldur's gate 3 is silly you know, and um, and uh, 
it's so I, I kind of feel like PlayStation Plus and Xbox Game Pass potentially is a sort of a sort of compromise between what Gen Z and Gen Alpha to, to the next next problem Gen Alpha Gen Z and Gen Alpha have grown up with the concept of games being free. I kind of feel like Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Plus compromise and bridge that gap a little bit. And it's not actually like I don't think it's PlayStation Plus or Xbox Game Pass or subscription services as a concept that's driving down value. It's what you said earlier. It's iOS. It's free to play. It's gacha and gambling and all this kind of stuff. Because you know, I don't know if you, I don't know if you got any Gen Z or or, or younger people that you know who game and stuff. And I don't know if this is just a British thing, even, or again, it's 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 anecdote. It's hard anecdotes again, but I just like I think a lot of a lot of what's happening with Game Pass and consolidation and exploring these models, it is the mid to long term problem that Xbox, the existential problem that Xbox has. And this is you know when I was in LA, I was talking to people at Xbox about this to some degree. Um, they were all saying, like, you know, the, the younger gamer, for them, it's their iPad that's their console, you know? Mm. And they see what we consider to be a high-quality gaming experience at $70. They, they see that as ridiculous. So I don't know if you've, if you've got any thoughts in that direction with regards to the way free-to-play and Gen Z and that, that mid-to-long-term problem for the industry. Because they want to yeah, grow. They, they want to grow these. They talk about $100 million for Horizon. Like the only way you get a hundred millions for Horizon is making a free to play version of it in some capacity, I think. Well, I think the first of all about Horizon, I think they're they're they show a complete predilection to run that bad boy into the ground. So don't be surprised if you see some <laughs> some free to play thing. God forbid they just made a trilogy of games and then left it. There's an um, there's an alloy skin in Genshin Impact, isn't there? I know. Which is cool, that's fine. But I just uh I really like Horizon actually, and I'm I'm so sad for the uh the MCUization of it as they uh, make seven different games and remake Zero Dawn and do all these other things. But to your point about like these younger kids, I, my, again, all anecdotal, but I have six nieces and nephews in my life. Um, for, my brother has two kids and my sister's, um, my one sister has three and my other sister has one. And their experiences are all different because I've tried to kind of equally indoctrinate them. Um, and, my brother Dagan, who does a lot of shows with us on Last Stand, is a, a a professional animator and a lifelong gamer, and he's done plenty of indoctrination himself. And what's funny about his kids, he has a, a daughter and a son. Is his daughter, his older daughter, doesn't even play games anymore. And her, his younger son, though we used to play NES and SNES games, and we just the stuff that we grew up with. And he just plays Fortnite. He and sometimes he plays, you know, Zelda or whatever on Switch. But then my my sister. Uh, Dana's three boys, I've successfully indoctrinated them completely into console gaming. And <laughs> uh and they're they love it. And a couple of them are just total PlayStation fanboys, which is really funny. And then my sister Allie has a daughter, and what's so frustrating to me about her is that I really tried to take the time, you know, she's an only child. I'm like, all right, let's get her into games. And I bought her a Switch and I bought her um Mario, and I think later I bought her Animal Crossing and she just doesn't care. Like she'll play it a little, a little bit, and then she'll come over to my house to use my pool or something, and she'll have her bag, and she'll like be playing on the uh, chair, and she'll be playing her goddamn iPad. And I'm like, what is this? What are you doing? <laughs> I gave you a switch. I bought you a switch. So I think it's totally mixed. Like my experience with the younger generation, but I think what you're speaking to, Jez, is the paradox, and it's well said. Is is like there's always been this idea that there are 300 million core gamers, right? Isn't that the thing? Where they're yeah, like, like 250 and, million they're fighting over playstation right. nintendo and xbox yeah R right and that like they just people come in and out and it just remains that number and i know that they want to grow that number and i think you're right like mobile free to play all those things matter i think that's what i was saying to you earlier about how we want to declare our stance on value because i'm willing to say even if it's a dying cause and it might be just be a cause that that whittle you know withers away into nothing is that i believe games have value i believe games have more value than the the monetary reality of games which is already so big has even realized and i think it's worth fighting for a gamut of opportunity in the games industry from the most casual free to play and gotcha sort of stuff and subscriptions and loot boxes all the way to and we talk about this on sacred to games that would cost essentially a hundred dollars or more if people were willing to spend it on the finest triple a single player or multiplayer or whatever experiences i think having a whole ecosystem that supports all of that is ideal but unfortunately i don't think that we're going in that direction and i think what you're speaking to says that 
but um well this is but this I is the argument for, that yeah. microsoft sorry to cut you off but th- that's the argument microsoft puts forward about game pass is that it, it enables develop it frees developers when they get the bag it frees them to ignore some of that business model stuff and that sort of like we have to put a gacha mechanic in here we have to put some kind of loot box in here or whatever whatever kind of odious mechanic it is you know and we've seen like with abk it's gone completely nuts uh, you know head over heels into battle passes and celebrity tie-ins and all this kind of stuff which doesn't appeal to me but clearly it makes them a lot of money you know so i kind of feel like the the reason i i'm sort of bullish on game pass is because I kind of feel like it does enable that creativity a bit like they talk about how pentiment wouldn't exist if it wasn't for game pass you know and like it's a, a great little artistic project from a, from a small team and you know i feel like i kind of i'm on board with that you know um and i would hope that maybe playstation plus can do that as well to sort of enable these the kind of experiences that we enjoy and ultimately a lot of devs who are our age they want to they want to make these experiences too they don't necessarily want to be making you know gacha free to play pay to win kind of stuff you know i don't know yeah and jez you always mentioned how you have a unique perspective because you grew up poor yeah (laughs) and you didn't have the money to play all this stuff and so like you look at game pass differently because you're like oh my god if i had this when i was younger where yeah, I think a lot of people, I second hand, every single you know, when you, when you did your whole uh, journalist sitting up in their ivory tower thing, looking down on everybody, right? <laughs> you, I don't uh... know. I don't know if Colin remembers that, but you know, a lot, a lot of journals didn't like Jez because he was like, I've been poor and I know what it's like. Well, and you know, to me, to me, like they were talking about like $25,000 $25, being poor. I mean, being poor. And I was thinking like, I was earning like eleven thousand dollars in my first job, you know, um, and kind of stuff. But obviously, it's different when you when you're in New York. The pur- purchasing power is completely different to the north of England, which is a, basically a wasteland. Um, but uh, but yeah, like there there is that aspect as well. Um, you know, obviously, like Colin said, it's it's a no brainer for the consumer. But I suppose the debate is whether or not it's going to be healthy for the long term creative viability and the energy of the medium that we all love in different directions i guess can i ask let me ask you this and i wonder you guys think of this because i brought this up on my show and people don't think it's a very compelling argument but i i think it tells us something i wonder what it tells us you were brought up pentiment right um Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was looking only six percent of people that play pentiment beat it Mm -hmm. and i went and looked at hi-fi rush and only 10 percent of people that played hi-fi rush beat it now, no doubt these numbers are spiked by being free to play and people just try it and get out. But what do you think they're being what what kind of information does that give Microsoft? To me, well, that says that doesn't that say like why do we even bother making long games at all? Like why do we even bother? I when I was playing Halo 2, I was surprised I was getting diamond achievements for beating the game. Well, the, and it's, I was, it's and not I was a like, new thing. It's not a new thing, actually. Like I mean, EA EA's talked about this in the past and this is this is something that kind of for some reason it really stuck in my mind because when I was I was reviewing Mass Effect Andromeda, um, like, and this might seem like a tangent, but it's, it's it'll get relevant in a second, I promise. I was, I was playing Mass Effect Andromeda for review. Um, I was I was triggered because none of my decisions mattered. Like none of the decisions I was making in the game mattered. Like I couldn't I couldn't affect Ryder's personality at all. And then I realized that. I can't remember where they'd said this and I couldn't find the exact quote, but obviously I, I didn't pull this out of my brain. It was, it was some dev doc or something. EA was talk EA or Bioware was talking about how only 30% or something, some percentage, low percentage, only 30% of players played Renegade in Mass Effect, right? And, and that informed them that, okay, well, no one wants to play Renegade. So let's just make it so everyone's a paragon in Mass Effect Andromeda. Consequence of that is, now nobody now your decisions don't matter but like, yeah everyone's every, you're forced to be a paragon and therefore it, it, the game feels less good and i think like the same is true for completing the game like if you know that the game's only three hours long you know you, you're probably not gonna care to play at all you know and i will say that like 
nobody completes games. Uh, I've been like, I've been, this has pretty much been a thing since forever, you know, like. Well, wait, but, but, but I guess the point I was making is 40% of people that played Final Fantasy 16 beat it already. Ah, so, so, th so actually, like, you understand what I'm, like, the point I'm, I guess, like, it's, I'm it's, wondering it's what, I'm skewed wondering. It's kind of by Game Pass, though, right? Right, um, but even if, it, no, it is skewed from Game Pass, but even if you skewed it five times, it still wouldn't be that, that number. And I guess well, what I'm saying is, is that if people, in my opinion, uh, here's what I wanted to say about, and uh, is about Pentiment and, and Hi-Fi, which I understand are great games, is that if only 6% of the people that watched a Netflix show in its first season got to the end of it, they would cancel that show. And if only 10% of the people that got to the end of a series got to the, you know, began a series, got to the end of it, they would cancel it. So while we're saying that these games should exist and it's awesome that they exist and I love that they exist and it's wonderful, I don't think it necessarily makes a great point. I think what it says is that a lot of people just simply don't care, don't play games deeply. And if you're Microsoft trying to, to fulfill not selling a game at a time, but rather a subscription service, I think that that data tells you some pretty powerful stuff. And I think I saying... Think it, it, that's, that's my opinion like that that's why i bring up that 40 percent of people it's 38.2 actually right now of, of people that played final fantasy 16 beat it i mean that's i don't that, think that microsoft just, like yeah. i don't think microsoft looks at completions as a, as a metric i mean it's probably going to be more like hours played probably like if like for example i don't think we're going to get a red fall sequel <laughs> because um you know you can look at that and it dropped off the face of the earth um pretty quick are they ever going to release their dlc they were going to release dlc for it weren't they and then yeah they, 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 sure they were i'm sure they have to right yeah i mean they've, they they've funding people they've said yeah. they said they're gonna but um that game looks super cool by the way i thought but i never not. played it it's, it's not it's, it's not, not i love vampires i'm a big vampire <laughs> guy maybe uh, when the 60 frames I mean, option comes to console but i am like the hugest arcane fan you can imagine like i love dishonored one and two and pray and all i played that game for five hours and i'm like no this game has no soul it feels like a game that Arcane was forced to make and not one they wanted to make. It feels like a relic from the holdover. Of Bethesda was like, oh, well, the industry's changing underneath our feet. We used to do single player. Now we have to do live service. Uh, 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 make a live service game. And they just weren't equipped to do it. Mm. And yeah, I was so disappointed with Redfall. I mean, it's it is a, 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 it's kind of confusing because like you go on True, true Achievements and look at Hi-Fi Rush and it... It shows like the percentage of people that have, uh, have earned the achievement for completing the game, but like I remember, like when I when I completed Eve Within, and this was before it went into Game Pass and before Bethesda was required, like completing that game was a rare achievement as well. Um, I just don't I just don't know if like it's such a problem that the ability to sample a game um, is necessarily informing Microsoft on what games should be greenlit. You know, I mean, we need to, we probably need to wait to see what it looks like in maybe two to three to four years from now. Like if we do, if we do get to a situation where like Microsoft's only green light in service games, but even then it's kind of like, there's a finite amount of people who will play a service game, you know? So like it kind of, it kind of informs that having a lot of variety is probably really important, you know? Um, yeah. I, I, I get Colin's point. We, I get, I, yeah, so do I. But I, I still feel like some of this stuff's kind of still in an early infancy kind of phase. I think we're going to see, like, we're going to see potentially if Call of Duty come, does come to Xbox Game Pass, if that is the play, and we do see some sort of mainstream uptake of Xbox Game Pass, maybe then we can see some of the negative effects that all in mentions but well i would say i get his point because i have looked at that and i've had said man you know i always joke with you jazz because you don't finish games unless you review them whereas i'm the complete opposite i don't play a game unless i'm gonna beat it or any game i do start i finish right um and i, I and this is pokemon. kind of a well because pokemon's one of the worst franchises ever to be created <laughs> um but that's neither here nor there like you pentiment and Hi-Fi Rush, right? I fell off Pentiment. I played it for an hour, and I'm like, this is not for me. So I figure into that, hey, only 6% finished this game. Because I would imagine Pentiment's not for a lot of people, right? They don't really make games like that anymore. Now, Hi-Fi Rush, uh, that's 
obviously a little bit more mainstream and it's also can be a little difficult maybe a little bit to get into and i think like the intro level is not the best but people not completing games has been a thing forever and i also look at it like this whereas pentiment i don't think is actually a thing unless for game pass like without game pass pentiment doesn't even exist right and i think you're going to see a lot of games from microsoft that have that sort of thing where some of the criticism around PlayStation, Colin, is that they make the same type of game repeatedly, mm. right? You know, the third person over the shoulder, sad dad simulator, you know, the, 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 the memes that people say about PlayStation, right? Um, whereas an Xbox, you get a little bit more diverse uh, stuff where like some people who are really looking for, really looking for those PlayStation experiences don't get them on Xbox. Um, and so when you when you play some of these games, they're not really up your alley, and there's no all your you know you're fifteen dollars in, and you're like, well, at least I didn't spend seventy dollars on this, so I don't have to finish this, right? A lot of so a lot of the Game Pass stuff is that don't have a lot of completion rate, high you know high completions. But then when even when I look at PlayStation, like you, we talked about high, Horizon Forbidden West, like you're probably your favorite game that PlayStation's released this generation, right? Uh, um, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. And I looked last night, and that's only got a 35% completion rate, which, you know, isn't that high for a game that is only single player. It's designed to be beat, and only a third of the people beat it. Or even like something like God of War Ragnarok, you know, uh, came out last fall, and that only has like a 45% completion rate. So, I mean, l less than half of the people that spent $70 on it or more didn't even think it was good enough to complete. Right, those are more in general, you know. Right, but I, but I think we're. I agree with you, but I think I agree with both of you, but I think we're talking about different things, like a a, a thirty or forty percent completion rating and a six percent completion rating or a ten percent completion rating are two different things, and I do agree that it's weighted down by people sampling things, but I simply am talking about what it suggests about what a games pass like or game pass like service would need to survive, and I think see. This is why it's actually come out a lot with the writer's strike recently where the reality about Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and all these things is that most of their shows are not watched by anyone and that they're sustained by a small number of huge shows, but that there's some sort of dispute on where the value is. Is it with the volume or with the quality? And so I would argue that Game Pass has value, perceived value because people have access to lots of different games, and that's going to become really expansive with a huge back catalog, which I think will always be valuable and interesting. But for new releases, um, I think it's a lot dicier because a game like Redfall would have just bombed on the market and might have put Arcane in ex in Arcane's very existence into jeopardy. And that is a it's different when that can be buttressed by a lot of different other successes and failures on a mm -hmm. platform. So I just think that those two things matter. And I think that I, the reason I bring up completion rates is because yeah, it's always been known. My brother and I always talk about how trophies and achievements are so fun because for the first time, like you, you can't f go to your, the recess, you know, or go to recess and lie about something you beat or be like, yeah, I, I fucking beat Ninja Gaiden, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Like <laughs> you, you have to prove it. And I love that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm with you, Rand. I've beaten, I think 19 games this year so far. I love playing, you know, sometimes I bail out, I bailed out of like Hogwarts legacy, for instance. But I bailed I mean, out of Saint Tro. I couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, Saint Tro. I was thinking about buying it, but then I because all the DLC was out. But then they still are, they're still charging seventy dollars for it. I'm like I'm not paying. Maybe I'll buy it for twenty. You know, uh, only in Game Pass, eh? <laughs> yeah, or it could be in Game Pass. Sure. That's a. <laughs> I actually think that Embracer. It's funny when that news came out about um, Savvy Games Group being the per the uh, the oh, group yeah. that was going to yeah, bail yeah. Um, them out. I'm like Embracer would be perfect for Microsoft. Like that's. Because they make the kind of game that I think, like, uh, Dead Island 2, I think, would be a really perfect... I platinum that game, and I think that that would be, like, a perfect game for Game Pass, where it's it's kind of, like, 20 hours long, and it's pretty good quality, and it probably wasn't that expensive to make, and, and those kinds of things. But I think, aren't you guys compelled, on the other hand, by... And this is something we bring up on our show, and I'll be curious to know what you guys think of this, is that I think it's interesting that three major CEOs in the games industry are on the record basically saying that like to make the kind of triple a game we're talking about that i think we all love that the the sales situation kind of needs to remain the same and that they they don't really go to game pass or look at it so that's bobby kodak 
um, as an example. And we know Strauss Zelnick feels the same way with with new releases. I kind of feel like they have I feel like they have more interesting insight because they have the luxury in their position. We were talking about that the senders game before, yeah. mm-hmm. for instance. And I would imagine that that studio is probably more game to game. Right. And so this is something that um, we talk about at Lilymo, my studio, is that we would be very happy to take Microsoft's money. And we've sold our games to games with gold but uh, in the past, but um, we would be very happy to take Game Pass money because it means we would just survive to the next game. Like we didn't, we wouldn't have to worry about it. And that's really great in the small pocket of indie development, but I'm much more intrigued by the, the world where they don't survive game to game and where they just look at it through the big picture of quality versus value and say like, this simply isn't a mathematical equation that works for us. Um, I think, I think Bobby Kotick called it value destructive during the FTC hearing in which the judge asked him why you would even sell your company to them then, which I thought was a pretty compelling argument actually just an interesting kind of snafu on his part but don't you guys think that that's interesting that that you know to to um it's kind of a different shade of what sean Layden was saying as you noted in 2020 where they're just saying if you want grand theft auto 6 or you want whatever battlefield or something like that you got to pay for it and well, i'm willing to kind of defend that place because no game really comes like that outside of first and second party to to, to game pass because we were talking about Exoprimal. It's like Capcom's probably thrilled to hedge their bet on Exoprimal because it's not gonna. It was gonna bomb when it came out, you know. So I, I just feel like w- the only way we would really see Game Pass's true value is when, it, when one of those big players says, "You know what? You're absolutely right. We'll, we will rather take the Game Pass money than sell it." Well, yeah, but, but I mean, the two the two CEOs that you mentioned, Bobby Kotick and Strauss Selnick, they're also the ones who are. They dominate the status quo. They dominate gaming as is currently with Grand Theft Auto and NBA 2K and Call of Duty. And yeah, I totally believe Bobby when he says it's value destructive. Like, if we put Call of Duty in Game Pass, who knows what it could do? It wouldn't be good, right? I I completely agree with you when you said earlier that a lot of these publishers probably don't want to do day one Game Pass releases. And I agree. I mean, look at the evidence before you. Like, nobody really does those anymore. There was kind of an an area where they tried where they got MLB the show because of some loophole, you know, but like who's actually the publisher there. And it's the MLB. What a punch in the face that was, by the way, man, what an epic, what an epic move. What an 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 epic move that is. It really was was, hysterical. It was hysterical. Yeah. And then you had Square Enix tried out with Outriders and you had Warner brothers tried out with, you know, back for blood and stuff, but you really haven't seen too much of it, which gives me, okay. When, when Jim Ryan said publishers hate Game Pass, I'm like, no, they don't, because I can clearly see all the publishers putting their games in Game Pass. But what I don't see is publishers putting their games day one on Game Pass. So to me, it says, yes, publishers don't want to do their games on day one. But then I also look at what Bobby Kotick did to Activision Blizzard, where like Activision used to release tons of games that weren't Call of Duty. And now they only release Call of Duty, Right. It's like they basically took all their studios, all their other studios like High Moon and Beanox and everything, and just threw them into the Call of Duty mas- machine. And so even though he says it's value destructive, it sort of ruined Activision a little bit in my eyes because before at least I could get something really cool from them, and now I don't uh, at all. And it's just like they're also the two big ones who are like, you know, like, hey, we want the status quo to remain the same. And of course you would, because they're the ones making the most money and the benefiting out of status quo remaining exactly how it is. is because right. when the status quo changes, you know, the leader of the industry is usually the one that suffers. And they would be the ones who would suffer the most if things changed. Um, but yeah, go, go ahead, Jez. The thing is, like, I do think that to some degree, Xbox is coming around to that thinking that day one game pack. Day one games in Game Pass are reductive, uh, but their response, because clearly um, they've recently started doing paid early access. So like if you pre-order deluxe editions of, of, of all Xbox's first party, you get five days early access. So I think that's a response to people not wanting to buy the games out right now because like those five five days of fomo that'll get a lot of people and clearly like you know despite game pass it does seem like the games are still selling you know starfield is number three on steam charts right now oh starfield's gonna kill dude we had a whole segment on this on sacred symbols about 
what was the uh, the word uh, I was talking to Dustin about? People use the word cope or whatever, and I'm like oh. everything everything that people there's just so much so called cope in the PlayStation ecosystem from more partisan people that this there's going to be something wrong or with this game when I'm like I don't I don't think so. Yeah, guys. Like, this game is going to be huge. Yesterday, you know? um, there was I saw a bunch of PlayStation guys blowing up because some some outlet had said that the review code copies are going to go out on day one. Or something because they were getting a review code on day one yeah that's not um, true but but yeah it's it's uh it turned out not to be true um but um yeah I, I the whole console thing is just it's just so silly like um but it's well i think I it's great to have a preference for, i think i think it's great to have a preference i just don't understand why people are so militant about it yeah you know? that's that's like, that's that's what i mean like it's it's yeah. so it's so ridiculous to be militant because at the end of the day you know it's it's all games you know and i would like it's it should be celebratory that there is some form of competition and that's what ibk and game pass kind of represents for me as an xbox centric creator is that like i i and phil said it himself in the kind of funny interview is like if they were competing on playstation terms they probably wouldn't still exist you know and that they'd, they'd be going down that path towards not existing and I think, like, I don't, I don't know if you agree with this, Colin, or not, but I feel like an industry that was without Xbox would give, would be bad at the end of the day, because it would give PlayStation and Nintendo sort of free reign to dominate their respective verticals and potentially push costs higher and stuff like that. I don't know how you feel about that. But I no, do I, I don't like want Xbox those... to go, I don't want Xbox to go away at all. Yeah. Um, That's what I don't feel that way. That's yeah, I, I just, I don't really understand that. I, I think a lot of I, my, where I get, you know, uh, annoyed with the entire situation with ABK and all that is just that it's not the way the other two companies built their gaming enterprises by buying publishers and just kind of scalping things off the market. It's just simply not how it went. And, yeah. um, and I do think that that matters. It gets to the point, like the partisanship gets to the point where people pretend that Cygnosis was anything more than basically a developer of video games in the UK that was making an SDK <laughs> for PlayStation. I saw someone say they were the biggest publisher in the world when Sony bought them. I'm like, dude, they were making Amiga games and Commodore games. <laughs> I don't know what you are talking about, but what you're saying is a complete lie. So people will say whatever they want. That's more of the kind of creative art part of it to me yeah. is, and I use the, I use like kind of the small ball versus big ball mentality in baseball of like building teams um, and people make fun of the term, but organically, which is a term of business, like organic and inorganic. In fact, Sony is acknowledging that it wants to grow inorganically now because it's hiring someone literally for inorganic growth, like someone that specializes in nonlinear growth. But I think the reason that Sony and Nintendo have been so high quality in game output, which is somewhere that Xbox is obviously lacking compared to them, is because they did it kind of the hard way. And I I think that that's worth noting and analyzing and acknowledging. Um and that that is a differentiator between the brands. That's why I always say when when Sony was doing these one night stand acquisitions recently with like Haven and Firespread, I'm like, oh man, they're already like starting to break the mold that made them good because they never made purchases like that, right? And I kind um, of like, yeah, I, I kind of I see what you're saying, but it's it's also like we don't have the my, well, Microsoft doesn't have the benefit of reversing the clock. They have made heaps of mistakes over the decades, and I kind of feel like this is the only way they can catch up. And the thing is, right, when I do talk to Microsoft people about their thought processes with regards to ABK and and uh, their approaches to subscriptions and stuff like that, it's not Sony and Nintendo they really talk about. It's always Tencent. It's always Tencent who they talk about. They talk about Genshin Impact subscription service, talk about Star Rail subscription service, because they both have in, in like a World of Warcraft like subscription attached. Yeah, Sony's to them. deep in with Tencent with uh with both of those games too. Yeah, and and Microsoft too. They've got the whole Game Pass League of Legends thing where you subscribe to Game Pass, you get all the League of Legends characters and all that kind of stuff. And like Tencent Tencent does this like constant thing of rather than buying publishers outright they they own 49% of epic or some 48% or something like that they own they own 
bits and pieces of loads of different different studios and kind of sort of influence the direction some of those franchises and games take and i think i think that's where microsoft really wants to be and that's what worries me about microsoft's thought processes is like is is there is there still hardware <laughs> in Microsoft? and this is this is something rand pushes back against me on because i'm constantly thinking like when they do talk about tencent tencent oftentimes doesn't even put its games on console they put their games on pc and mobile only um they don't they don't care to invest in console and stuff like that and um that's what worries me is like is there a future where xbox just doesn't even bother with hardware at all you know and and Rand says i'm ridiculous about that and he, he's probably i mean right. i i said um, i said who who can predict the future 10 years from now like i've always said we'd have new, we'd have hardware this gen and we'd have hardware next gen but after that i mean you know, when you're getting into like 2035, who can predict that far ahead? I mean, if you went back to 2013, and if you ask Colin in 2013, hey, do you think Microsoft and Sony would ever do crossplay together? I'm sure Colin's response would have been like, absolutely not, right? Because who could see that far ahead? And who could see that big of a change happening of, of Sony and Microsoft pl- gamers actually playing together in the same game? Nobody thought that was going to be a thing until it actually became a thing, right? Um. I, I guess, um, Colin, with you said about like um, uh, with Xbox kind of like doing it the wrong way, I guess, because you said Sony and Mike and Sony and Nintendo did it the right way. Um, well, the market the market kind of declares that, right? Based on the long term success of their of their game studios, it's not like it's not it's not really a value judgment. I, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be mean about it. No, no, I know I know you're not yeah. trying to be mean. I'm just saying that I think. Microsoft, I, I sort of feel like one how disastrous the Xbox One launch was, and Satya took over for Balmer, and he was just like, "Why are we in gaming? Why are we doing this at all?" Uh, convince me why we should be in the space, and somehow he was able to convince him. Instead of shutting down the division down or selling it off to Amazon, he was able to somehow convince Satya to invest, and not invest like just a small amount, but like turn the budget up way. $7 billion, $70 billion, $80 billion, whatever you want to call it. Um, I sort of feel like this was the only avenue to do that. Like this was always, like to me, when I would have conversations with Phil uh, back during the Xbox One gen and what he, what do you want to see from Xbox? My first response was, I want to see great games because that's all I care about. I want to see great games. And, I, and my, my concern to Phil was always, you don't got any studios, Phil. You have you have five studios and all of them are on single single experiences like Coalition with Gears, 343 with Halo, Mojang on Minecraft, Turn 10 on Forza. And you made a bet that okay, we're gonna we're gonna be like we're gonna work with Insomniac and Sunset Overdrive and Rise with uh Crytek, and you made all these bets and they didn't pan out and you got you landed flat on your face. So my you know, what I wanted from Xbox was to acquire. I was like, acquire who you can, get whoever you can, because I want it's Xbox your to have fault. a great first party system. <laughs> and I mean, Phil went above and beyond what I thought, right? Like you got all those studios in 2018, then he bought Bethesda. And I'm like, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted Xbox to build this sort of uh, network. Now, ABK, I didn't expect, but when you're behind the eight ball and when your competitors are Nintendo and PlayStation and then PlayStation is out there making those deals you know, as we know from the court documents, uh, once they try to go after Starfield, Phil was like, we can't have this because that is essentially going to, you know, we're already a third place console and we can't be seen as like losing these things. So we sort of have to stop this. So like acquiring these companies is Xbox's own way of securing their own survival in the market. Uh, why, couldn't Sony... X- why couldn't Xbox just get their own third party exclusives like they used to? Because they cost I mean, an exorbitantly amount more than that cost Sony. That's the other thing. It's like if you wanted to get a third, like if you, if Xbox went to fi- uh, Square and to get Final Fantasy 16, it probably costs six times as much as it costs PlayStation to get that to get it from them. Because then you got to account for all the lost sales that they would have on on PlayStation. And you know PlayStation sells the most Final Fantasy and the bigger platform. So business wise, it just doesn't make any sense to make that deal. But for Sony, it does because. They're the ones, you know, leading everything. And for them, 
all the sales around PlayStation anyways, so it's like, okay, we can we can kind of chip away at Xbox here, make Final Fantasy exclusive, um, get these games from Bethesda. Um, and I think Xbox yeah. was 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 in a rock and a hard place about how they wanted to approach this. It was either you need to fight and acquire and make it like so you're unassailable, or you sort of give up. Either you're completely all in, or we're we're all out. And I think they made the decision to be completely all in. And now we're seeing like, okay, the ship takes a long time to kind of course correct and we're there. And we're at the point now where it's like, okay, the competition, Tencent, PlayStation, they're all acquiring because they all know it's an arms race with content and they need to stock up in the future. And Tencent's never going to stop. They just purchased um, uh, the people who made um, Dying Light 2, uh, Techland. Oh, Techland, yeah. Right? Uh, you know, PlayStation is probably still going to acquire in the future. X, I mean, Phil's been on the record saying, yeah, they're not going to stop acquiring. And I'm sure you've seen Xbox fans saying you need to go after Sega next, right? Because Sega, we already right. know Microsoft wanted to acquire Sega why, in 2021. Why this, I, I just, let me ask you this though. Okay. <laughs> Activision's operating income, so their, their profit last year was $2 billion. Mm-hmm. And my, Microsoft just spent $70 billion to buy yeah, a company that overpaid. does $2 billion in profit per year. I don't. I don't know if really regular people care, Colin. Like honestly, well, I don't think regular people care about any of this. But we're talking, of course, about no, no, no. Sure, <laughs> true. Itself. But when you say like people shop at Amazon, and they're the you know giant corporate monolith that shut down mom and pop stores, like people, like I don't know, like the hardcore console warriors, they'll care because they'll be like, I'm. You know, we talk about why do people do that, and it's like, well, you internalize what you like into yourself. So I'm a PlayStation guy. I'm an Xbox guy. We do battle. My brand's better than your brand. Us versus them. Tribal mentality. It's the same as Apple versus Android or I mean, wrestling WWE versus AEW, right? Um, (laughs) For whatever reason, it kind of fits in that mold. And it's just kind of, I don't know. I just don't really think when he's like Sony did it the right way or Xbox did it the wrong way. I don't think that really matters in the wrong run because the regular consumers they're just going to go where they see the best value, the best games, the best prices, the best experiences. And they're not going to worry about how the content was acquired or how, uh, you know, well, Sony, you know, built these studios back then and Xbox acquired these things. I don't think it really matters in the long run. I think it only really matters to people like us that talk about this. Yeah, I don't know that I, I just don't know that I agree. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jess. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. I I was just going to say, like, it's... I mean, it's it's again a lot of it is speculative because I I'm 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 perpetually salty that EA ruined Bioware in my head. You know the the decline of Bioware's games and playing Baldur's Gate is painful because it's like man, Dragon Age could have been like this, you know. Um, and I, I blame EA for that, you know. And I kind of I kind of see where some people might think like Microsoft's dropped the ball on Halo, extrapolate extrapolation. Well, yeah, they are, they have to some degree. Um, drop the ball on Halo, and then to extrapolate from that, you could buy you people might end up blaming Microsoft for if World of Warcraft goes into decline anymore, or or Call of Duty ends up being really terrible, and st- so on and so forth. So, but like, um, it's 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 sort of like it could also go the other way, you know. A lot of it's sort of like we don't know, and there's a lot of like. There has been a lot of change and upheaval at Microsoft in in recent years to accommodate for this desire to have better games and better content and and to be more like Sony, you know, to get those to get those game of the year worthy titles. And um but I think like like, you know, getting there organically, I don't think that's an option for them anymore. I don't know if Colin disagrees or no, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying in terms of it's not really an option if they want to compete here. Yeah, because they they squandered all that time by not doing it, you know, in, in very well. And I think that that's why to express the concern from the outside for you guys, it's like, well, why does it matter if my if Activision goes there and Bethesda goes there? It's because it's because like a, a company that hasn't really shown that it has great game making chops is now subsuming things and becoming the bosses of these firms that make great games i mean that's why i keep saying the best thing that they could do now is to fire xbox's leadership and put in activision's 
if you guys want to play ball, no, that'd be awful, that, Colin. And, that'd be awful. <laughs> and get people going on. I mean, one company knows really what they're doing. One person, you know, Bobby Kotick bought Activision for $500,000 and then turned it around into this. And I think yeah, that, but, like, that, that's, I'm just, I'm just using it as an example. There's too sure, much optical sure. baggage with him. But I want to say that that's like, that's a major concern. Why, people ask, like, why does it matter? It's like, it matters because, um, as an example, if you want to talk about Nintendo, which I think is the highest quality games maker, um, they said recently in an interview, actually, I think it was in one of their financial calls about expansion. They're like, we don't really, like, you can't just go buy Nintendo. Like, you can't just go buy, like, a studio and be like, now you're a Nintendo. Yeah. It's like, that's a genetic thing. That has to come from somewhere. That's why they go out and they make these long-term, you know, relationships with an intelligent systems or a monolith soft and invest money in all those things. That's why it matters that between the launch of PS1 and the PS5, Sony never purchased a single entity that it didn't already make games with. Yeah. Right? I mean, like that's that's that matters. Like people act like that's not true, but it is true. You know? And even after PS5's launch with Bluepoint and Housemark, those are in the, those are acquisitions in the old style. And that's why I keep saying that there, Sony has so few second party partners now, really, that like, I guess you could see like maybe they would buy Arrowhead or something, but like there's no one that would even make sense for them. That's the way I want them to grow because that ecosystem gave us, like you said, the game of the years. It didn't, the game of the years didn't come from mergers and acquisitions. I mean, like it, I'll, like, <clears throat> I'll push back a little bit because I do kind of feel like there are a couple of acquisitions which do kind of feel like they fit what you're saying there with Microsoft. I feel like Playground kind of fits that bill. Because they, they were always with Microsoft and on Forza and Forza's Forza Horizon. Like, I don't play racing games. I don't, Rand, I think, I've dabbles. In I love Horizon. Horizon. Okay, I love enough. Horizon. But um, it's a, it's a big game. And I think, I think that, I think while Microsoft has had a lot of, a lot of misses, I think there, there are sort of, there is enough evidence where I'm still kind of willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not a Halo fan, admittedly. I'm not a Forza fan. And, you know, a lot of the games which I like to play, um, oftentimes haven't been made by Xbox First Party. Like, I'm a third party guy and I'm a Blizzard fanboy, of un 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 unashamed Blizzard fanboy with over 10,000 hours in World of Warcraft. I'm one of them. So, like, are you, would you be willing to, like, give Microsoft the benefit of the doubt? Because. I do feel like they have been kicked up the backside a lot by Xbox fans, PlayStation fans, external commentators, and all that kind of stuff. Do you think Microsoft oh. could eventually have the kind of culture where they do earn some of the studios in your eyes? Or is it more a moralistic kind of thing for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I don't think it's... I really just think it's about the end product. Like, I don't think if Sony acted in a more consolidative way that um, that they would have gotten the outcome that they had. They had to kind of, like, test the grounds, make sure the partners worked. Because Sony's working with a lot less money. So Sucker Punch is a great example, right? Sucker Punch made Sly Cooper, Sly Cooper 2, Sly Cooper 3, and then Infamous. And then Sony bought them. And that's because Sony was really deliberative about, like, does this work? Can we afford this? Does this make sense? Think about all the games they made with Insomniac and Housemark and all these other studios. I think that in some way, when you have that reciprocal second party relationship, maybe even going over multiple games, that those second parties start to kind of feed what it even is to be a PlayStation studio and so on and so forth. And it's not to say that all their studios succeed. They've had some pretty radical failures and some failures that I think weren't the studio's fault. Like I think Zipper kind of got a, a bad rap at the end based on the PSN outage and all the rest. But I think that there were some studios like Evolution that really dropped the ball with Drive Club and they paid the price for that. Um, so I don't want to say it always works out and it's always perfect. But here's a good example. And I wonder if you guys feel this too. When I, you know, people share, like especially the fanboy accounts, they share like these, um, it's like, here are all the PlayStation characters, and here are all of the Xbox characters, and here are all the Nintendo characters. And I look at those pictures, and I'm like, one of these things is not like the other, right? On Nintendo's, you see Mario, and Kirby, and Pokemon, and all these things. And on Sony, you see Drake, and Aloy, and Sackboy, and blah, blah, blah. And then on Xboxes, you see, you know, Master Chief and uh, Marcus, which is fine, and makes a lot of sense. But then you see, like, Crash Bandicoot, the Psychonauts guy... Uh, the Doom guy, uh, 
you know, BJ Blaskovitz. I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know, like th- this, th- if th- that's not the same. And I think that that's worth noting. Like that's just a conglomeration of things that you put together. It doesn't come from any specific, sp- you know, spirit or uh, the je ne sais quoi of your particular brand. And I think it's... that that's, to me as a gamer, like that's a bit of a turnoff. That's why I think that these consolidative efforts are so lame and that Sony's going to be forced in some way to make these stupid moves and dilute their own brand, I think sucks. I lament that, but I understand that that's a lamentation that's divorced yeah. from the market reality. But I think that does that make sense to you? No, no, no. Like, I, as a Blizzard fan, I kind of feel that you know, I kind of feel that as a Blizzard fan, because um, you know, Blizzard Blizzard has historically a very unique identity with its games and and sort of put in I don't know, Thrall or Sylvanas next to master chief it does it does feel forced but i will say that i'm also in a wait and see kind of optimistic phase and i want to believe that microsoft can earn some of this stuff um over time and i'll 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 let you know like because it is one of those one of those fantasies like xbox fans always talk about um and they talk about oh well microsoft owns all these characters now um they are they own like all these you know doom guy like you said and and all the bethesda characters and they own you know uh, they potentially most likely gonna own all the world of warcraft characters and overwatch characters and, and starcraft characters crash and, and spyro of, and, and yeah crash yeah. and spyro and all those that old xbox stalwarts as crash and spyro <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but i and people always say like they should make a kart racer game or a smash brothers clone and stuff like that i actually put that to uh, I won't I won't name names, but I put that to an exec at um in LA and they they came back to me and said we have to earn it. We have to earn a game like Smash or we have to earn a game like uh uh Mario Kart. So I think I do think to your point, Microsoft is aware of some of this stuff. And I think that's why they're gonna let they are letting Bethesda run themselves and they are gonna let ABK run themselves in and so, and similar kind of tone to the way Tencent pretty much lets all its properties run themselves, and it's kind of why they've rebranded Mar- Phil Spencer's role as the CEO of Microsoft Gaming, not necessarily the head of Xbox anymore. Um, but that's where some of my concern comes in. Is is kind of like, is it is it going to become a, a sort of dispassionate conglomerate, or could it eventually become something more Nintendo like, where it's a celebration of these characters all under the same wheelhouse and the same brand. I don't know. But I think yeah, a lot I mean, of it is wait and see at the moment. I, that's the whole thing is that I don't, I want to be clear that I think that it's, it's fine and great that those characters are together. I think that the thing that makes it, as I said, n- off kilter is that Microsoft has nothing to do with those characters, you know? Um, and that's like, that to me is a, so yeah, it's a different kind of ecosystem. Like you said, I guess it's going to take time and they're going to have to earn that. But I don't know the whole instinct of like having to buy entire publishers because your your competitor makes third party deals is I don't know I I think my I think a lot of people have drunk the Kool Aid on that Microsoft angle. I think, um, I think because if, be, no if, if I might, if I might it's just because before I forget it's like when Microsoft made made a deal for Titanfall should Sony have gone and bought Take Two or something when Microsoft mm-hmm. made a deal for Bioshock exclusivity or Mass Effect Two or what Ninja Gaiden uh blue dragon tales of vesperia <laughs> like you know like there's a lot of exclusives that microsoft did the same exact thing with uh limbo inside you know uh nobody saves the world i i guess i just don't understand this argument that oh the competitors do making moves we got to go buy an entire huge entity and consolidate around us um i just think that that's really an extreme reaction um and is not really there's no requisite reality in which that that was even necessary i do, so, I do yeah, think that, that, yeah. some of it is some of it is the tencent thing i know microsoft has a lot of fear about tencent for some reason and i think like i think one of the things that i'm eager to find out is what is actually their plan here because you did you, you brought up a great point that 70 billion dollars is a lot of money for a company that turns over two billion a year you know, it, it's kind of like what what is the plan and the strategy? Because it do, it does seem a bit extreme, and I've, I I think I've I've been on the record on Xbox Two saying seventy billion for Activision and Call of Duty, and 
especially when the communities around Overwatch and Diablo and Call of Duty are not particularly super happy right now. A lot of people are playing these games, but it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, you know trepidation, I suppose, that some of these franchises could be declined. But that's that's another discussion, I guess. But I do I do want to yeah. I'm I sorry, good. I'm just saying, like I again, as a Blizzard fan, I I want to know what what their actual plan is, but I suppose it's it's either like you can have a glass half full perspective or the other way. Can I we all agree so. that the fantasy, and I know you guys probably don't share this, but I see this a lot. It's like, man, now we're going to get a new prototype and we're going to get a new singularity. And we're going <laughs> to, and I'm like, if you think there's any world where Raven isn't on call of duty, slave labor, um, especially after paying all that money for that apparatus, I think that there's a lot of short term wish casting about what's going to come out of this deal. Not, Long term, not maybe reuniting id with Hexen, for instance, or um, things like that. But I just think that people are reading too much into it. I'm like, no, you bought Call of Duty, you know, along with a bunch of other things. But that well, machine this, yeah. needs to operate that way or you don't get Call of Duty anymore. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, and I, that's they bought into it now. There's that's theirs. That's theirs. But now. maybe maybe for only for, for the way to Call of Duty exists is to be part of that machine, because we already kind of seen the year release for Call of Duty kind of falter. And maybe Activision as a publicly traded company can't support releasing Call of Duty every other year. That it would tank their stock price really bad, right? Because games take too long and they're too expensive, right? Because even, even with the new Call of Duty this year, Modern Warfare 3, all the reports were that it was Modern Warfare 2 DLC. And then suddenly, no, it's a brand new game. And I yeah. guarantee you that game's probably not going to be very good. Right. Yeah, this is the second time they've kind of run up to it, right? With that one year right, where there's yeah. no no single player. So or whatever. maybe yeah, you're right. maybe being part of Microsoft allows that. All right, we just bought we bought them for seventy billion. We need to protect Call of Duty's. I don't want to say like lack of a word here, but integrity. We need to make sure people still love this brand, and we need to make sure it's of high quality, so we can actually afford to quote unquote fix it by allowing the developers extra time to make games, to make their games in between releases. So instead of Infinity Ward being on the clock every three years, maybe they got five years. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe in that situation, the perfect place for Activision to be is with Microsoft because they can basically uh, afford that to happen where Activision by themselves publicly would never be able to, right? Or Bethesda, like the market was completely changing underneath them. Um, you know, you mentioned like all the games that Microsoft bought exclusivity for, and I do agree, like Microsoft does buy exclusivity, maybe where it makes sense, but nowhere, nowhere on the near scale PlayStation does now. Uh, but like back then, nobody was really selling, nobody was really buying. Now everybody's sort of buying and selling. And you have the situation where Microsoft knows they need content for Game Pass, but also... I think it's beneficial for the companies that they acquired. Like Ninja Theory, I know you're famous, you know, the quote always goes around of you saying, why'd they buy Ninja Theory, right? Like what'd they buy them for, right? Yeah. But Ninja, yeah. Theory, Ninja Theory wanted to be bought. They didn't want to do the rat race anymore of pitching to a publisher and trying to get funding and doing all these projects. They wanted security. And Microsoft came in there like, okay, we can offer you the security, you can make what you want. And you know what? You can make creative freedom. Because that was one of the always one of the hits with Microsoft was that they meddled too much and that the game suffered as a result, right? Obsidian, I think, is going to be pro very prosperous under Microsoft. And even look at Bethesda. Bethesda clearly wanted someone to buy them. I, the type of games they make don't really jive with the sort of market that the video game industry shifted into. When you look at the failure of 76, you look at the failure of Wolfenstein Youngblood and then Redfall. So, like, they clearly were selling. And... It was like, okay, well, Microsoft's clearly in this area of like, we are expanding, you know, and I mentioned before about we either are all in on gaming or we're not. So it's like, there's an opportunity here to add something to Xbox. So you go and get it and you have this long history with maybe ABK. It's a little bit different because they're like the biggest third party publisher, but I view it as like, I don't think Activision, the way they currently are, are constructed well enough to last five, 10 years into the future. You mentioned how basically Bobby Kotick should have run Xbox or the people running Activision should run Xbox in the future. But I sort of don't want that or I think that would be a bad idea because 
Bobby Kotick basically destroyed everything about Activision and all their studios to make a single game that maybe can't stand the, the, the test of time. So like my nightmare scenario of like, let's, 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 you know, okay, ABK comes in, Bobby takes over Xbox, all those studios that they purchased, Obsidian, Hell, uh, you know, Ninja Theory, Compulsion, all of a sudden they're only making <laughs> what makes money instead of Pentiments, instead of maybe South of Midnight, instead of maybe some experiences that aren't going to push the needle or maybe aren't going to push Game Pass, but exist strictly because you have, you need a variety. Now all those studios are part of the Blizzard machine or the Call of Duty machine. And I think you, you run into the same problem that Activision ran into, which is one of the reasons why they needed to sell. I, I, I don't know. I, I come from a, from a different uh, viewpoint on that. Um, mm. That I, I, sort of, I sort of look... I will give you, however... I'll give you this, Colin. So I sort of view ABK and Bethesda as acquisitions that were beneficial to both parties, as well as a lot of Microsoft's other acquisitions. I will say if Microsoft went and bought Capcom, as much as I would like, like that because I love Capcom, I would view that as like... Mm, that maybe is crossing the line because what does Capcom need out of that? Are they struggling? No, they're at the best that they've ever been. The only reason Capcom would sell is because their price at this point is the highest it's ever been. And as you know, like building a business, some people build a business basically like you're going to sell at some point, right? So Capcom, I view, would be like, all right, now you're just kind of flexing, right? Because all these other acquisitions you, you you've done have sort of been beneficial both ways where... I sort of view Capcom would be only beneficial in one way, and that'd be to Microsoft, uh, not necessarily to Capcom, because what does Capcom need? Uh, you know, they're doing better than ever, while the other companies were sort of doing, uh, you know, worse than before. So I, I will give you like that, where it's like not every acquisition is good, but I do feel the ones that Xbox have made recently are beneficial to everybody. It's just that I, I sort of feel like. It's just not a beneficial to PlayStation and their market position where now they're like, oh my God, Call of Duty, we can't lose that because uh, our gamers might flip, more people might choose Game Pass and stuff. But that's the sort of competition we need, right? Like PlayStation clearly destroyed Xbox in, this gen in the Xbox One gen and it was, either, it was either come up with a different strategy or just be gone. And they came up with a different strategy. They came up with Game Pass. Phil was somehow convinced Satya to invest. And here we are today. And now, you know, with ABK, you look at the revenues, Xbox, PlayStation will be, eh, you know, kind of on the same, same wavelength. And that could lead to, you know, some really good things for consumers, you know, down the road where if the, the two companies were a little bit more equally, I, I, I always kind of view this as like, this is better for consumers rather than like this is going to be Xbox just destroying the industry in total and, and that these acquisitions um, were, weren't needed. Because I, I sort of feel like they, they were. At least mm. that's, that's how I kind of look at it. Well, I think the, in, the intent will come through. In, like Microsoft's ultimate intent, for instance, I thought the most eye roll worthy part of the FTC thing was seeing Microsoft's list of every single developer in the entire industry that they wanted to buy. Um, well, which I thought I mean, was, you, you know, which I thought was, has it, that same list. Though. No, they don't. Um, no, they so, don't. I totally dispute that. And here's why. Okay. <laughs> what, what, That's fair enough. Fair enough. No, I dispute it because like, where's the evidence that they would ever, that they've ever made a purchase like that, where they would have 130 studios that they were eyeing. I believe that they have a, a list of maybe five or 10, like, you know, like these are the ones that make sense. So I, I totally, people say Sony has the same list really. So like, what was the purchase that Sony made between 93 and 2021 that would have anywhere been on that list if this is the kind of thing that they would also do so i, I totally dispute that and i think that I mean, that was I did, I did hear sony bid for bethesda yeah i don't know anything about that and i don't know why sony would want a publisher anyway this is the whole point like sony shouldn't want zenimax zenimax should just do its own thing and interact with sony on a voluntary basis um and that's that's why i kind of want to keep repeating my hope is that sony continues to just Maybe make a new studio. They haven't done that in a while. You know, like make a new studio from scratch. And mm. it didn't really work out the last time they did it with Pixel Opus, but that didn't really cost them any money. And those guys were kind of more Sony movies guys anyway. So it's like, maybe they can get something like that going, but I don't want Sony to be involved in publishing, you know, external games. That's just not what I really am interested for in the, in the right. brand. It doesn't make any sense for me to feel that. Like, so 
I understand what you're saying, and I think you're right. Like remaking the economics is the only way to compete, and that's that's natural. And I'll I'll repeat that. I think that Microsoft has done a really great job adding value to Game Pass, and I think that that Game Pass and subscription model is generally speaking for let's say twelve to eighteen months out for any game would be amazing. Actually, to the point where you can imagine situations where people just stop selling games after a while and just put them on these subscription services. And I think that that would be really interesting. And we'll see if the industry wants to go down that road. But it's kind of like um, the healthier movie industry analog of like going to the theater and then having like the aftermarket, like video on demand and your DVDs and shit like that. Maybe like some sort of differential where people will do both and want both to be able to support both the AAA and high end and boutique industries. And then do it a different way but i just think um i don't know when i when i hear these ideas of microsoft buying even more i am so turned off by that like that that seems like if nintendo and sony were looking at each other and and, and being like well this is really a pretty crazy reaction to what's going on and i understand the whole 10 cent thing but i do dispute uh 10 cent is probably interested in many entities but I think the government in the United States would get involved and kill any deal that Tencent tried to make that was big. Yeah, I, th I think um, I think that is why Tencent does these sort of like will buy a part of you rather than fully outright buy you. Right. I, I do. I do think that being a Chinese company, that there's probably some kind of oversight there. But I hear what I'll, you're I'll saying, say and there is there is oh. disruption and. There is, like I'm nervous as a Blizzard fan. Like, what are they going to do? You know, what is what is Microsoft's plan for Blizzard? We don't really know. You know, but I'm trying to keep an open mind. I don't know. I just I I I um I hear you guys. I'm excited for you guys as Xbox fans to have like new entities to deal with. And it's I mean from a from a content creation standpoint, it's probably really fun too. I mean, you have all these teams to work with now and these ideas and obviously tons of money. Microsoft spending more money than ever and making more money than they ever have on xbox and i think all that is great i just think that i refuse to go along with the idea that it doesn't affect everyone and that there aren't a lot of like i say deleterious or negative effects towards um other entities that need to be you know kind of brought into the focus and and at least discussed and that's why i see things like uh oh activision would have been sold to tencent i'm like I, the government doesn't want the pga and live golf to merge and that's a two billion dollar deal yeah. Do you think that they're going to let that happen? I mean, that's just insanity. But it could be that they go to one of these other countries and buy something in Eastern Europe or whatever. I just, I think the consolidation, everyone's scared of consolidation, but the the company that's consolidating the most is Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft's acquisition of Activision, uh, we were talking about this on the, on the show. We were trying to kind of do the math and figure it out. If you stay within the console-centric space, the acquisition of Microsoft is prob or the Microsoft acquisition of acquisition of Activision is probably worth more than every single ac acquisition ever combined mm -hmm. in in the console space. I mean that's how big it is. Mm -hmm. And that and even Bethesda was worth more than every acquisition Sony had made up to that point combined. So again we're dealing with just different different things like when you talk about Insomniac at 229 million dollars that's a steal um compared to what they probably would have had to pay more recently but i i just think um those are the points i kind of wanted to make is that i just think yeah these things exist within this ecosystem in xbox i think it's great for xbox it's great for game pass it's great for maybe consumers they'll make that determination but um yeah. i'm not going to put my head in the sand either and pretend that like it's normal that a company is just trying to gobble all these things up and that it seems like there's a vociferous fan base that wants them to even go further and i look at that and be like why don't you just want their games on your console that doesn't that that's what we usually would want. And when people say like, oh, so Sony can take something away from them. And I'm like, I don't want that to happen either. Like, uh, so I don't know. I just can't relate, I guess, to, yeah, to that kind right. of line of thinking. No, I, I totally get that. I mean, I guess we'll find out how it goes over the coming years. But um, yeah, I think like we've been, this has been an amazing uh, discussion. And it's been really like great getting your perspective. and all that Yeah, thank you for stuff. having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for um, hearing me. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, I got we got a couple of Patreon questions that people want to. Well, yeah, to. I would just want to say, uh, if you do, you, well. do you need to like leave right away? No, um, I have time. Have I have a couple. Time. Okay, yeah, okay, we have. Yeah, I have, have a couple like Patreon. I mean, you guys, have, like I said, you guys have been very generous with the with the Dukes, and I'm happy to reciprocate. That's <clears> awesome. I'm actually going to go. You know, I'm going next, on Dukes. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, 
Well, I'm not. I, I don't know. Whenever Maddie asks, I'll be there. But uh, we're having uh, Maddie is going to be on Xbox Two Plus One next month. Yeah. Oh, great! We, we figured what what better time for the Bethesda creator to come on to talk about <laughs> to talk oh, yeah. about He'll go uh, on and you know on. Starfield uh, yeah. when it when it releases next month. So he's in his yeah. pocket right now, isn't he? I mean, oh yeah, he oh, totally is. He totally yeah. is. I'm like, um, I'm beside myself with with hype over Starfield. It's it's yeah, uh, exactly you're my gonna kind be, of game. I know I'm gonna get a whole bunch of DMs. Like when Jez starts playing a new game, <laughs> he like kind of like str- like DMs me stream of consciousness thoughts about stuff, right? So I'm just dreading the moment he gets Starfield and he's just DMing me about how you know how he feels about the game. Yeah, once the um, NDA is lifted. Um, yeah, we won't we won't be able to get all these questions, but no, no, no. This uh, is we answered we answered we answered a lot of them during the show. I think a lot of people asked questions about topics that we already covered, but there are there are a couple that we could yeah. throw in here. I wanted to circle back around this because this is something you said in the beginning, but we did have a question about it. Uh, CJ, he says, hi, gents. During this interview, during his interview with Destin the other week, Colin said he didn't want ABK to go to Xbox as they are the least creative of the big three. Or I'd say Xbox is currently the most creative with the most variety of games they're looking to release in the near future. Can Colin explain why he said this? Yeah, uh, it's I, as I said earlier, I actually have the paper somewhere because we were just talking here. Here it is. Is that um, I'm a I'm a really chronic note taker, so I'm sorry about that. I'm like surrounded by friggin' paper at all times here. But on this thing here, it says um, Microsoft. So what I was talking about, and this was in preparation for Destin's conversation, these notes, and I brought this up earlier. So it was just a, a not a value judgment, but just an observation of the companies. Microsoft is a services and computer company. You know, it makes all of its money off of, or really a, a vast majority of its money off of things like Office and Windows, of course, Azure and server stuff and less than 10% of their revenue comes from gaming and they don't have any other creative units. They don't, for instance, have a uh, television unit or a music unit or whatever, or even a really electronics like unit that makes wide ranging um, consumer electronics for a bunch of different lines. But Sony, 25% of its revenue comes from gaming, 10% from music, 10% from movies and TV, 20% from its electronics. Sony per cap, for, per money made makes more money in financial services than Microsoft makes in gaming. And so that was the point I was making about the creativity of the two units and how you would want, if there was going to be, consi- I, I keep saying this about Nintendo, but if you wanted a unit to consolidate, it would be Nintendo because they're the creative company. So you'd want them to get all of the creative stuff. And I get scared when companies like Microsoft or Amazon, I mean, look at the failure of Amazon's game unit for the most part, right? Mm. I'm going all the way back to Lumberyard and all those kinds of things. I just think some companies are cut out for it and some companies aren't. And yeah. Microsoft seems to be cut out for it, but I just think that I'm wary of creative entities going to non-creative companies. Yeah. Just because you're, like you're not, Microsoft... You're not saying... The, so, oh, God, so, yeah, I think some people thought you were saying that Microsoft's games aren't very creative. No, that's I, not I, what I, I meant. What I meant was that Microsoft is not a creative company. You know, yeah. like they're a, they're a services they're not in, and they're not, company. They're not in creative, is what you're right. Saying. Like they're not. You'll see it. In, uh, you guys go through their financials. I'm sure. Like they go yeah. they go over Xbox last, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. it's not it's not, it's not right. the, it's not their DNA, is what you're saying. Right, and Sony goes over games first. Yeah, and that's that, I guess that's the point I'm making about the two companies. It doesn't mean that Microsoft can't or doesn't make good games or doesn't have a place in games or any of that kind of stuff. It means that they they don't care about them. <laughs> you know very much and so it's a little nerve-wracking like you say maybe this is a sign that things are changing and they want that percentage to go up but that's what i meant about it it wasn't a yeah. value judgment it's an observation so yeah. see okay. a lot of people came at me with that but that that makes a lot of sense um did um, you did you uh there's a there's another one here that i thought because you answered this before the show we actually talked about this a little bit this is from raj um colin on the last sacred symbols uh because I, I guess he subscribes to both so for both of us which is awesome on the last yeah, second nice. simples you mentioned that you like turn-based games but you also said you had no interest in Baldur's gate 3 can you explain why for us ps my son joey is a supporter of lsm i support xbox 2 here uh i want to love leave the console wars we have at our home to your imagination <laughs> but yes um, cool thank you for your support and thank you for thank you for your thought yeah so i just don't like crpgs i don't like the perspective um I don't like the interface. You know, like when I see an interface with like a bunch of different, it's like uh, you play World of Warcraft, like you always talk about it. Yeah. Uh, you see all the different, you know, clicking <laughs> things and all that. And I know it can be played with a controller, but the last time, so Only I got my mods. start in, uh, 
Oh yeah, I guess you could do it with uh, uh, all sorts of different things. I guess I just Dragon Age Origins was like the last time I really um, even ventured at all into that genre, even put a toe in it because I don't even think that's like a full CP RPG. But that was yeah. back when I got my start in the industry. I was a strategy guide writer, um, and I wrote the strategy guide for IGN for that game, and uh, I hated it. Um, and I wanted to do it because uh, I think I pl I think Mass Effect came out maybe a year or two before, and I wrote the guide for that, and I really loved it. So, and I like Bioware going back to Kotor. I'm not like a huge fan before that stuff. So yeah, CRPGs. I'm just I'm very as my audience knows. I'm very particular about the games that I play. I just know that I'm not going to like certain games. I know that certain games drag, um, and they're just not for me. That's what I actually found so refreshing about Halo Two, having played it through it for the first time since college. I was like, man, that was quick. <laughs> that felt great to me. It took me two nights, you know, and yeah. I'm like, great, I can move on with my life. And I got a good experience. I just I don't mind games taking an enormous amount of time either. But Baldur's Gate, I just I don't know that I really get off on choice either. I just don't really care. I want I, I love linear tight experiences just as much as I love open experiences. So that ne doesn't necessarily draw me in. That's but um, I'm, I'm amped strokes. that people love Baldur's Gate three. I mean, that's so cool. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled for Larry and congratulations to them. Yeah. And uh, I, I am, I am just, I am just so deep in this game right now. I mean, I've been, I mean, like, I've been dreaming about dice, man. Like dice, because you have to do dice rolls to some of the decisions. Right. Like, the dice have been appearing in my dreams. It's, it's so bad. Um, uh, let's see if there's another. We have, oh, yeah, we have a, one from uh, Chimera Chasm. He says, a question for Colin. If Starfield ends up being the high quality product we all we all hope for it to be, would Colin have any intention of playing it himself? If so, where would his preferred platform be for experiencing Starfield? Xbox or PC? I would if I played it, I'd play on Xbox because I don't like playing on PC. I just I'm not a I'm kind of a Me too. A, a little bit of a Luddite. I don't you know, like I'm like, eh. Yeah, we're just, console peasants, right? Oh, I'm totally. <laughs> I, I even I even with electronics, Dustin always makes fun of me because I, I still have the clicky phone iPhone with like the button. Like the SE, you could still oh, buy wow. them new, and I'm like, I would rather have that just because I and I have like the SE watch, like just to for my like vitals. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very lo-fi. So I would play on Xbox, um, but Starfield is just too intimidatingly big for me at this point in my life. I just the way they talk about it, I could I could see myself being. Let me think here, like 16, or I'm 38 now, but or like even in my early 20s in college and being like, I'm broke. And this is what I can afford, and I'm gonna lose myself in this game, and just just have a great time with it. But when it's like, oh, go to planet after planet, and they're all this big, and it's this many hours, I'm like, I don't know, man. I just, it's just too overwhelming for me. I feel like that's such an opportunity cost to play it. So I do want to say though, and I told my audience this, I, is that I think, and I said this earlier in the show, is that I think I said Starfield, I think is gonna get a 90 on Metacritic. That was my prediction on the show, and I think it's going to be a real return to form. I think it's going to have like, you know, that Bethesda jank. I think there's going to be a lot of funny shit going on around social media with videos and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But I think the heart and soul of the game is going to be there. And I think that's obvious. And the, and I wonder if you guys agree with this, that the reason I think so, and this is what I sold my audience and sold them on was this is maybe the most important game Microsoft has ever released. And yeah, I was actually um, thinking of writing that editorial recently. Yeah, you should. I would love to read what you do. I read your, by the way, I read your work and I think it's really good. Um, Thank you. but, but, uh, I think that you could look at Halo 3 and all these other games, but they were kind of on top of the world when some of these games came out. And, and Halo 1 and 2, I didn't know Halo 2 sold 8 million copies on Xbox. That's an amazing attach rate, 1 and 3. Um, mm -hmm. So they've had these amazing experiences in the past, of course, and Gears during its renaissance. But I think per the time it's being launched and per the importance of it, I think that they know that Starfield has to be great. Yeah. And it's going to be great. Because I think anything less than that is really injurious to Xbox's, I mean, imagine if it's not going to be, but like a Fallout 76 level debacle, right? Mm. Like that's, that's, I think, uh, like maybe a, a, a literal, a literal nail in Xbox's <laughs> coffin, you know, at this point, um, cause they're going to be blamed for it and it's going to be this huge Bethesda game and this failure. Like I just refuse to believe we were talking earlier and you brought up dice rolls, Jez, like I, all the different dice rolls and permutations, like I just see the permutations coming up. Great game sells a bunch of copies on PC, probably does pretty well a la carte on Xbox as well because the game's so big, why would you even subscribe for it when you could just buy it for a yeah. few months worth of Game Pass? And then, of course, it's going to drive Game Pass subscriptions. So I think there's every reason to be positive about it. I will be truly shocked if it's not great. That's awesome. 
I mean, and, yeah, that's what that's what we're expecting. Um, we have a, another question here uh, from Elijah. It says, "Hello, boys." A short one. Anyone notice how Xbox was bashed for having three games mainly Halo, Gears, and Forza? But here we are in 2023 with Horizon, Spider-Man, and God of War. All of these being good games mainly, but the bias is clear. Why the lack of hate for PlayStation having little to no games aside from those three? In my mind, we should see PlayStation YouTubers and media with headlines including nothing but this. It's very strange. Yeah, I don't actually disagree. We had this argument on the show recently. I'm really... I use MCU and Star Wars as examples uh, of like gratuitous levels of beating something into the ground. I haven't seen all the Star Wars stuff. I haven't seen nearly all the MCU stuff, but just knowing that there's always a TV show, there's always a movie, there's always something. It sucks. Like, why would anyone want that for something they love? Something about what makes us love something, I think, is the rarity of it, the scarcity of it. It's something special because there's nothing else like it or we won't get a sequel for a while or whatever. And Sony was actually pretty good about this a long time ago, as you guys will recall, not only with the second party and third party stuff that made them big in the PS1 era, like Spyro and Crash, like they kind of knew how to move on from those at the right time. But you think about Jack and Daxter with three games and you think about Uncharted being, you know, four games and you think about uh, Infamous being three games and so on and so forth. They kind of knew to move on. And I think that my major concern, and this was something Sean Layden was speaking to, is that a lot of the investment that goes into IP building goes into multiple games so that you kind of take a sunken cost in the beginning to be able to build on it later. And because of the necessity of doing that, it almost makes it suicidal from a financial perspective to not go back to these things over and over again. And I get that. But when I hear Horizon, which again is something I really love, I think the two Horizon games are awesome. Call of the Mountain was really boring. I actually didn't even beat it. Um, but the, the two console games are awesome. But when I hear that there's going to be a, an MMO, a multiplayer game, the third game, a remake a Netflix show. I'm like, that sucks, dude. You're ruining it. (laughs) And, and I think that, so I think that there's something to be said about that. And you were talking, I think Rand, you brought it up earlier about Sony's games kind of all seeming the same. I think that there's something to that too, just in that, even in the twisted metal show, which is surprisingly good, it's post-apocalyptic. And I'm like, why does it, we already have a post-apocalyptic game. Like we already have a post-apocalyptic TV IP. That's really big right now. And Twisted Metal is not post-apocalyptic. So that was a choice that you made to kind of make it more the same. So they, I think that there's something really valuable to that. I do hope that, and what we were saying, and the, th- the thing was people were busting balls, and I was like, uh, listen, they're like, oh, so you wouldn't want another Horizon, like Horizon 3 or whatever. I'm like, listen, take Uncharted, the new Uncharted game, take the new Horizon game, take the new Ghost of Tsushima game, take them all and take them away and replace them with new IP all day. I would take that all day. And unfortunately, we're seeing the new IP in the games as a service space. People were busting balls about fair games, and I get it, but I actually think the idea of that is kind of cool. And I was couldn't help but think about what that would be like in a single-player game. So we're getting those new IP, I guess, along with the games that they know they can bank on because they've invested that money into it. But it makes it so that there's less new IP, and my real hope against hope is that the new Naughty Dog game is a new IP. Um and maybe a new, you know, a Sucker Punch game, or I'm sorry, a Santa Monica game that's not uh, God of War. Something new is coming from Media Molecule and so on and so forth, but I'm not necessarily hopeful here. So I totally agree with you. And I don't even think it's a quality conversation either because Halo and Gears of War and Forza are all very high quality. So it really is a, a double standard if you look at it like that. Yeah, right. Um, I, so they've got two more questions left. So this, this will be short. Um, I will just throw in I though, that I've, I've been playing Returnal a little bit on my Isis ROG. Oh, it. isn't it great? Yeah, it's really, really cool. Oh, it's, so it's really good on the Returnal. I haven't pl- so I I haven't played either of the Horizon games. When I played Horizon Zero Dawn, I was burnt out on open world and I couldn't get into it. Right, but outside of that, I played all of Sony's games. I mean, that's why I bought my PS5 for. Like, it literally only turns on when there's an exclusive to play. Right, which I just got done playing Final Fantasy 16, and I love aspects of it, but then some other aspects, I'm like, oh my god, this is some boring stuff. Right. Mm. Returnal's my favorite exclusive of this gen so far from PlayStation. Sorry. I think it's I think it's the best. I think it's better than God of War. I think it's better than Spider-Man Miles Morales. So I like I am a Returnal fan. I'm a huge Returnal fan. I I really love that game. Um Yeah, I thought it was I love House Mark. Like I I think that um I have actually a one of a kind that I made Astra Corporation shirt that I wear on uh, once in a while. Um which people always wonder where I get it from because there's like no <laughs> <laughs> uh returnal merch but but I, I i'm glad you guys like it because i like it too and i was i think i think housemark was one of those acquisitions that sony should have made a long time ago and i think that they were lucky that 
they were still available. That was like one of the very few gets that I think made a lot of sense for them. So I'm glad that you guys like that. And I, by the way, I think it's better than God of War too. I don't know if it's better than Horizon. I think God of War is great. I just don't think God of War is mind bending like a lot of people think it is. Um, 2018 God of War was mind bending. 20 uh, Ragnarok kind of was like it just it was still incredible. Like I think I gave it like a nine or maybe or, you know, but like God of War 2018 was like a ten to me. Yeah, I, I, sort I think of I would felt... give. It... I would give them both an eight, I think, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I I was super high in God Award 2018. I just didn't feel Ragnarok lived up to it, but that's mm. just my personal thing. I, I've always wondered this. Um, you get clipped a lot, right, from mm. Sacred Symbols. Uh, you get clipped from PlayStation guys, and you get clipped from Xbox guys consistently for, for your thoughts. I know you're probably flattered that people really appreciate what you say about stuff right and they'll debate it on podcasts about hey colin said this and colin said this and colin said this but do you think it's weird that you're always clipped for things you say about xbox but hardly ever anything you're clipped for what you say about playstation um yeah i guess so i don't really see a lot of the clipping unless i'm like um tagged on it or whatever so I, I sometimes things are lost to me where I'll come across a thing many months later where I'm like, oh, this was like a thing for a day or whatever on here. I didn't know. And then I'll <laughs> click on it. And it's often it is often an because, you know, I, sometimes I get clued on it immediately and I have to like, you know, silence it or whatever. But um, I think that's the reason I think that that probably is, is because I'm pretty hard on PlayStation and anyone that knows or anyone that listens to Sacred Symbols knows that. And so I don't know that there's like an incredible amount that let's say the pro PlayStation guys are going to get out of me saying about beating them up or saying that they should do this, that, or the other thing when it's really not as glowingly positive as I think some people assume yeah. it is. Um, I'm, I beat up PlayStation on a pretty constant basis. I just did with Horizon, for instance. And I think that that surprises a lot of people. So I think that the clipping is probably less useful when my venom is going towards their favorite target and more useful when it's going against the target they want to attack. Yeah. Um, and the only thing I regret about the clipping, people can do whatever they want. I don't, some people are assholes about that stuff. Like they try to claim that stuff and, and copyright strike it. People have the right to say and do whatever they want. I don't care about that stuff, but I do think that it's often unfair just from lacking context. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I noted that went around for me was, um, when I was on iron Lords last and I said that who cares if something's exclusive mm -hmm. and that was clipped out about me, but that's not what I said. Like what I what I was talking about was in the context of if you're watching a press conference and you're excited about a game, who cares if it's exclusive? That's <laughs> was that was the point of what I was making. I Everybody didn't say like that. Everybody basically spun it as you saying exclusives don't matter. Yeah, but Period. that's not what like, I said. I mean, yeah, people can yeah. go look and and we'll go look for yourself. I mean, it happened. Something happened more recently where I leaked that Red Dead Redemption was going to be announced in August, and that's all I said. Um, it, it, I noted it at the same time that the South Korean games rating board noted it or whatever. And I'm like, this is real and this is going to get announced in August. And then some people were like, why did you say that the game was getting remastered and remade? And I'm like, I didn't say that. I said that the, the listing was real and that it's going to get announced in August. And I was right. So mm -hmm. why are you mad at me over these things? So I realized that there are some things that, and I'm sure you guys experience it too in your own circles. Like, people do that stuff and it's very disingenuous, but I realize that I can't really control it. And then almost, it's almost like a Streisand effect where if you try to fight back, you just make it worse. So yeah. I just let it go. I think that most people know where I stand. That would be a pretty silly thing for someone to say about exclusives where the most attractive thing about the PlayStation ecosystem is it's exclusives. And I say that all the time, but that's, I can't expect that everyone would know that. So there's just a lot of dishonesty in fanboy spaces. I do feel like, I'm seeing a real resurgence of Xbox fanboyism specifically that is very reminiscent of remember what was that symbol that people used to put in their names on Twitter? Oh, the, uh, the Scorpio, the, the Scorpio, Scorpio. Scorpio. Yeah. like that yeah. was the last time I remember being like really overwhelmingly Xbox slanted. And I feel like that's the case again, but that also is probably just what my algorithm continues to feed me for some reason, which is why I don't really like being on social media. Cause I don't find it, it's it's not very uplifting. It's it's usually very negative, and um, so I I regret the clipping only because it makes our show seem like something it's not to people that are not interested in exploring it more, and then they um they get mad about things. Like I did Destin Legary show uh, a couple weeks ago, and I looked at the comments. Someone was like, "Man, the comments are really bad," and I was like, "Oh," so I went and looked, and I kind of took 
I, I, I was like, oh, that kind of sucks that people feel this way. But at the same time, I looked at it and it's like, well, it's not about anything I said, you know, um, mm. like I didn't, so not, not attacking anything I said on the show. Um, and so I take that as a compliment as well, that I guess I'm fairly well engineered in my thoughts where people can't dissect them. So they go after things that don't really exist. It's like when I'm called a shill and I'm like, but I have no relationship with any video game company. So who am I shilling for? Yeah. Like, what is the, like, where does the conspiracy go? How deep does it go? Hey, but you um, always make sure to mention that you're a Microsoft shareholder, though. Not anymore. I, oh, not you uh, sold them? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I sold them. And that was that turned into a joke at our company, too. I felt bad talking at length about Microsoft without being honest that I had a financial stake in Microsoft. But I but when I, I got a new financial manager who sold them. So that's totally fine. And I'm, 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 it's good to be divested. I made a good amount of money on it, and I appreciate Microsoft. But I just <laughs> – I want to be on the up and up with people. Like, it's – I am I do some consulting, and I'm, I'm – probably i i'm being kind of um approached by this new project to consult and that's gonna have to if i do it i'm gonna have to tell my audience you know like that's just the way it's right. got to be because um i just don't want no matter what i say i don't want people to think that i'm like being dishonest or trying to yeah um obfuscate anything and so that's where that kind of comes from that spirit i think like yeah, i i i mean i really relate to the being taken out of context thing and people saying i'm a shill and you know, if, if, if people actually, like, step outside the algorithm for a second, they see that, like, the fans that, are, like, me and Rand and yourself, like, oftentimes we're some of the most critical towards the platform we prefer. We ultimately, we want it to be better for the for ourselves and the consumers that we're that are within <laughs> our community and i think that's the right approach to have by the way sorry that i slapped the mic earlier but i was trying to catch a mosquito yeah. Je jez will tell you jez can tell you remember when i went off on crackdown 3 yeah and you you got kind of i got tested people <laughs> at, yeah people at microsoft were not happy about that because i was just supposed to be hey we invited this person to e3 because I was good friends with Phil Spencer. He invited me to E3 to hit a million gamer score, which was, you know, incredible. It was always my dream to go to E3. Um, and I had critiques about how some of the games were, and I really went harsh on their Crackdown 3 stuff. Mm -hmm. And people at Xbox did not appreciate that. I was, like, frozen out for mm -hmm. a while. People wouldn't talk to me. It was just like, you're supposed to just keep your mouth shut. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And that was when I didn't I – did, my YouTube channel was like, five six thousand subs well, right this is the, this is the sort of the weird sort of uh, the contradiction that exists between the influencer marketing and, and media marketing because you know me media doesn't generally doesn't get shot out for having negative opinion or something but influencers and yeah. youtubes like that they'd be like oh we can't control this person we'll we'll just not yeah. engage I, them I, one all. of the one of the executives basically when he's when he's saw my stuff he's like you're not trained for pr like i can't believe you said that you're that that was totally you're so stupid and i'm like yeah as, as stupid as your crackdown 3 marketing team like i i was i went in because they went in on me and i was just like i wasn't having it i was like i'm not uh, look one of the criticisms we get about xbox 2 is sometimes we're too harsh on microsoft sometimes people just want to come to a a podcast and just everything be rainbows and puppy dogs and everything's great and Microsoft's king of the world and all their games are fantastic and they're going to dominate. And that's just not the reality of the situation I find most of the time. Like I'm super excited about the future and I have been for a while, you know? Uh, but yeah, one of the criticisms is like, Oh man, you guys are just shields. It's like, well, if anybody who actually listens to the show would know that we are definitely not right. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I, so I had that, I had that sort of, I had that view of, of last time media and, and sacred symbols because the only like and this this is a failing on my part but the only the only engage the only the only visibility i had of of the show and your content was the stuff that had been taken out of context you know and um i think it's um it's important to remember that you know things do get taken out of context by people who have bad faith bad faith well, that's why that's why i went after that that's why I went after that, you know, I went to the, after that one guy that clipped me out um, and Salty Gamer or whatever his name was and went on his show and <laughs> and it was he like a really embarrassing it, so. event for him. But I, yeah. I, I just did it to kind of prove like I don't take kindly to it. But then I realized like, first of all, I didn't want it to be like such a fucking devastating thing for him. And then 
And then the, the second thing was, that wasn't the intent at all. And the second thing was, I, I just started to kind of, it's like my dad always tells me, like, just accept the, the things you cannot control. Like, I, I just, either I have to start censoring myself in some way, or I just have to accept that bad faith actors will act in bad faith. And that's just the way it is. Like, yeah. there are just so many people, especially on social media, that do not represent the listener base of either this show or my show and stay silent and absorb things. I listen to a ton of podcasts and don't say anything. Not in the game space, but just generally speaking, like my political podcast and my football podcast and all these things, and I don't say anything. They don't know. And there's a bunch of me and there's a bunch listening to you and listening to me. And I just try to kind of keep those things in in um in focus because I don't know. I, I, I can't believe some of the people on social media are even real. Like like that they're real people, the way they act and all I I would love to see people's achievements and trophies for like the i bet you that there's a a really there's a a, a, a relationship a, a causal relationship between your lack of game time and your yeah. um and your twitter time bashing other people well, about games you don't play what i always say is those who speak the loudest usually game the least totally and if you're hiding your trophies or achievements you're doing i, I always say this and it just is what it is understand that if someone's hiding their trophies or achievements and they're in this like fight with you or whatever then they're doing it for a reason there's no other reason to to hide them yeah. unless you I don't always said my, my profile's public you can go look at all everything i'm playing that's you know perfectly fine but uh we want to respect your time so we got one more question and then we'll get you out of here on and sure it's just uh jo- joaquin uh he branch he says he wants to know uh what games oh my God, are you, you looking- pronounced his name right i know what games are you really looking forward to playing and uh, what Xbox games are you looking forward to in the future? Well, it's funny because it, first of all, I'll do the Xbox question first is that having played Halo 2 and now I'm in space moving forward where I haven't played the Halo games. Okay. So I'm actually really excited with Dagan hopefully to get the Halo 3 as soon as next week. Um, we do knock back every other week and he works a real job so he doesn't get to play as much as I do. Um, but in the short term, it's that there's that and then there's that What what is it? Clockwork? Revolution, Clockwork is Revolution, that the Clockwork Revolution. That's the one that looks like bio, yeah. bio, bio, bio that looks like Bioshock. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah that game looks dope. Um, yeah, it looks awesome. I don't know if it's going to end up because it's in Exile is doing that, right? So I don't know yes. if it's going to be. They're very nerdy RPG people, as you know. So I don't know if they're going to really nerd it up with that game, like Brian Fargo it up, or if they're going to have it be more accessible. But if it's something that's more Bioshock ish um, with some RPG elements, I think that that would be pretty cool. So that's that's kind of the game I have my eye on i honestly think that some of the stuff coming out of xbox just isn't like avowed it doesn't look very intriguing to me i'm not i've never been a fable person um yeah so there's not but the reality is, is there's not very much on the other side either that i'm interested in i'm I'm really kind of um we don't know what wolverine's gonna be yet but kind of bummed out that insomniac's getting stuck with marvel and i was i'm kind of hoping that they can get away maybe after this and not do more of these marvel games but for the rest of the year i'm, I'm looking forward to um the dragon quest game infinity strash i'm a big japanese game guy Mm-hmm. Uh, so I love Dragon Quest and um, I'm really looking forward to playing that. I'm actually going to do for uh, Sacred Symbols Plus, our supplement to Sacred Symbols. I've never played Alan Wake. Um, Ooh. So Ooh. I'm going to play Alan Wake and then Alan Wake 2 uh, when it comes out. So I'm looking forward to that. And that leads right into Spider-Man. But unfortunately, Spider-Man, well, I mean, fortunately, because I'm excited about it. Micah and I are getting married on October 28th. Uh, so that's just a week after Spider-Man. So our Spider-Man coverage is probably going to be much delayed. Um, and so those are kind of, and then Sea of Stars looks good. I'm happy to buy it. I'm not going to get it on PS Plus. That looks pretty dope. And um, yeah, that's basically it. I'd like to try to find the time. I didn't, I'm not a, tro- a, tro- a trophy cheater where people like pop their trophies automatically for in between the different platforms. Um, and so I never turned on the PS5 Spider-Man game. And uh, I might try to play that before Spider-Man 2 just to refresh myself because it's been so long. It's been like five years, I think. And I never played the DLC. So that's kind of like my more immediate road um, roadmap i think the next game that i'd probably put on an xbox for if it looks really really interesting and i have the time is stalker but mm. um stalker is going to come to playstation and i probably won't have time to play it at that time anyway unless maybe like you said it comes out in that december period which would be kind of kind of ideal and again i don't want to make it seem like starfield isn't going to be great although i said it was earlier it's just it's the same reason it's like a, a magnified version of why i won't get into skyrim i'm like i don't know that i can do this it, uh, the last game I got really overwhelmed by was Witcher 3, where every time I did a question mark, I felt like five more of them appeared on the <laughs> yeah. map, to the point where it was like hysterical. Like, I'm like, are they fucking with me? <laughs> like, I would go do with one, and then there would just be a bunch more pop, and I just... 
so I'm trying to manage that time where I'm not, I want to kind of get through a couple games a month, a few games a month if I can keep that pace up. Um, cause my audience gets mad enough at me as it is that I, I don't play a lot of newer games cause I'm always playing like some weird Japanese game. I was playing like bat boy and all this random stuff. So they're, they're already mad at me. I'm not playing Baldur's Gate three and they're probably gonna be mad at me that, Oh, hell divers. Also, are you guys going to check that game out? If you're into returnal, that might be an interesting yeah, I'm October's so packed though. It's like, oh my yeah, god, it is. it is so much. I actually have one of my oldest friends works for for that studio, <laughs> so I'm kind of like I'm kind of biased about Hell Divers in a way. Um, awesome. So I will I will definitely be checking that out. I played the original. I hope Sony buys PC. them and they become and your friend becomes rich. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know if they they have any shares or not, but. Presumably, I don't know. Startups usually give shares, don't they? I don't know. That'd be pretty cool. It's clearly, they they work very closely with Sony, but um, that might be the only target that makes sense for them. Yeah, you know, maybe at this point, because everything else is gone now, right? Like you would assume Quantic Dream, but that's gone, and then Supermassive. I think that that's not happening, and then Lucid, but that didn't work out, and then they were bought by someone else, and then so I don't I don't think there's that many options left. There, there so. Were- the reason yeah. that, like, near the start of the show, I talked about, like, I'd like to see Square Enix with Sony. And I think that's because I, I, I really feel like, I feel like Square Enix's management layer is kind of in this weird place where they're sort of, they, they think they have to be a certain way to appease their shareholders. And it's kind of undermining the potential of Final Fantasy. Like, I'm a, I'm a Final Fantasy fanboy. Like, I have been since I was a little kid. And I kind of feel like Final Fantasy could be elevated a little bit more if it was under a creative house like PlayStation. But I, I think that makes sense. But anyway, I was I was bummed reading their financials where they were noting. I mean, obviously, so they they basically said in so many words, we're just not going to do that many small games anymore. Yeah. And and I was like, that's a shame, dude, because in the I didn't actually get very far in it because of a very specific thing, but I was so amped to see Tactics Ogre come back. Um, and then yeah, they put in the arbitrage. I've been playing that. It's Dude, the level cap annoys me to no end in that game because that is yeah. not in the original, um, the PSP version or the PS1 version. But so, and then, and then that Act Razor Resurrection game was awesome. I loved Act Razor on the SNES and all. So I was just, you know, Valkyrie Elysium is supposed to be pretty good. But what they did was they just released too many games on top of each other. We, we were lamenting this on the show. Like, there's just so, they released something like 16 games in two quarters. What was and, that? What was that other? They released that other, another tactics game last year that i started playing oh front mission was it no no another one <laughs> that one <laughs> uh, uh, what was it now i can't remember oh what it was d- various daylight no that's not it i'm gonna look it oh. up for you. i know exactly what you're talking about it was like like uh oh, man you you Square had a horse Enix. and stuff video i can't remember what it's called it was really really strange i can't remember if it was a port or or some a remaster or something yeah, I'm looking here. Octopath, Crisis Core, Romantic Saga, Tactics Order Reborn. <laughs> this is oh, so- Diofield, Diofield Chronicle. Yes, That's that one, about. Diofield yeah. Chronicle. I play, I put a lot of hours into that as well, and I was well, just, I was just kind of like, I just kind of gradually ground to a halt because it just doesn't, it doesn't really get going. I kind of feel like, but that, but that there, there was like. They do release like a lot of games, like Triangle Strategy. I was also interested in playing, and a lot of people said Octopath Traveler Two was really good. So I was trying to get for Octopath Traveler One. Um, I don't know, but I, again, I feel like a lot of those games would would probably work better as under a platform holder rather than within Sh- Square Enix's shell or the cool yeah. Pro- you you might be right. I I think that I think Square Enix makes sense if you're looking at Sony par- purchasing a publisher. Um, cause there would be interesting, it would be interesting if Sony reinforced itself by making a consortium of Japanese publishers and really reinforcing its Japanese identity, which I think is really a powerful part of PlayStation. Yeah. Um, but I, I was looking at this, Jez, you might find this funny is, uh, so beginning September 13th, 2022 and over the next three months, this is, these are the games they release various day life on the 13th and then Diofield Chronicle on the 22nd, Valkyrie Elysium and Valkyrie Profile Lenneth on the 29th. Near Automata came to Switch on the 6th. Triangle Strategy came to Windows on the 13th. Star Ocean, The Divine Force, October 27th. Harvest Stella, November 4th. What? Tactics Ogre Reborn, oh. November 11th. Romancing Saga, December 1st. Dragon Quest Treasure, December 9th. Crisis Core, December 13th. Yeah, that's just... What do they, they expect? I mean, what do chaos. they expect? That's chaos, man. 
it doesn't say that you should make small less fewer games it's to say that you need to spread them out yeah it's it's totally nonsensical so i i was bummed to read that though because i'm a huge square enix fan um too and um the pixel remasters have been so good but i really hope square enix doesn't end up with sony because i think that that would i was amped to see that um for xbox fans that they're going to get final fantasy 14 i think that's going to be really good for the game and give it more players which yeah. is you know going to be good for its health but i don't know i would i would prefer for sony my ideal for them would just to be like we're investing we've we've poached this this person this person this person and this person and we've given them each 500 million dollars and they're making a new game you know mm-hmm. that would be awesome but that yeah. you got to spin that up you got to spin that culture up it's expensive it's hard yeah. so i know it's a little bit wish casting as well wish casting's fun but yeah, I think um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there, aren't we, Rand? Yeah, yeah. Well, we we have a great awesome, comment man. here from from Dead Planet in the chat. He says, "Can I just say it's not lost on me, and hopefully everyone else in this chat room, how special this discussion is? It's been a dream to want these two entities to collide. Hopefully, these crossovers happen continuously in the future because Collins' show needs this back and forth, and so does the Xbox too. Well, I'm yeah, glad that you, uh, you enjoyed the show. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I want to thank Colin for you for coming on and being generous with your time." I know you got a lot going on, but let everybody know uh, where they can find you. That the two people that don't know who you are. <laughs> cool. No, thank you. Um, I run. Uh, so our flagship at Last Stand is Sacred Symbols, like we said, and that's a, a PlayStation podcast. And you can find it on podcast services and YouTube and check it out if you like it. We're on Patreon, but you should definitely check it out for free first. And um, like you said, you guys have, are, do a um, are, appear sometimes with our Xbox show, Defining Duke, and we do a Nintendo show, Punching Up, and. Um, we do a few other shows too, but the beauty is that we're kind of a decentralized group of creators and um, we're all supported in one place on that Patreon, but you can check it all out for free. And if you uh, like what you see, uh, let us know. And, and thank you again for your kindness. I appreciate being here. I love talking, you know, about games, but I love having my opinions challenged as well. Otherwise I think um, you become passive and almost scared of the confrontation that's necessary to refine your ideas. And I, so I think that like jumping into the cauldron, no matter how hot is really, really important. And you guys are certainly continuing to be welcome on last stand, but we'll have you on sacred symbols as well. Maybe we can figure something out there too. Cause I think the audience would. Yeah. I've been waiting for Jez to be on sacred symbols with you. You know, yeah. I'd be like, when is Jez going to be on there? That'd be cool, man. Yeah. It's just, it's just time. Man. <laughs> but yeah. We, I think I, I tried to get something though. going with you in the spring. Right. And yeah. Then, yeah. You said you had a time, which is fine. I mean, you're busy. I remember media. Like it's a very frenetic life. Yeah. Um, it so I, I don't blame it you. Is. I'm, go- I'm going from Baldur's Gate 3, which, you know, I'm desperately trying to get to the end, but I think it's just going to have to end up being a review in progress. And I'm going straight into Starfield. And I'm the only person covering games. I'm going to Gamescom Cologne that week during Starfield review. So it's so like, I'm Rand, we're not doing a podcast that way, probably. Yeah. I miss my well, own I podcast because of work sometimes. But um, I'd love to come on and I'm sure Rand would as well. And we'll figure something out there. But this was awesome, man. This was awesome. And like you say, like refining ideas and and sort of getting an outside perspective on, you know, because I don't follow PlayStation that much. And um, obviously it is it is important to talk about the competition between the platforms because they do serve as a counterpoint to each other sometimes. And um but yeah this was great thank you very much man for coming yeah. on it's awesome yeah thank show. you again i appreciate it awesome. yeah um so yeah thank you guys so much for being here hope you guys enjoyed this uh xbox 2 plus one it'll be available to everybody uh probably like a week from now uh on jez's channel which we're, we're doing on now so uh we will be back on friday for a regular xbox two and uh thank you all uh love you and we will see you uh next time later thanks everyone. everybody bye thank you